didn't he? Good evening and uh, welcome to the College of Complexes. For those of you wondering where Brom is at tonight, his wife is just feeling a little ill, so I'll be doing the collecting for any of the three dollar tuition. Just as a reminder, it is a three dollar tuition for the college and a minimum five dollar purchase yeah. at the restaurant. I, the college is broken down into three formats. First, there'll be a brief announcement period, followed by the speaker's presentation, followed by a question and answer period. I may ask uh, Charlie to help me on the question period tonight, since I'm going to be doing some taping as well. And then after the speaker presents, the question and answer period will have the infamous rebuttal. This period. is a brief rerun. We have only two rules here at the college. One is one rule at a time. And the second one, I think you all know, no personal attacks. Yeah. Boo. Well, let's see. All right, let's get on with this uh, festivity of oratory. And I'd like to introduce Rob Burns, a former Green Party candidate for the U.S. House and Ph.D. student of political economy, says. Eisenhower's original goal for the interstate highway system was completion in 10 years. Though it eventually took nearly 40 years, much of it was completed within only 15 years. And though the program eventually invested $450 billion in today's dollars, it has been paid for entirely without federal subsidy. The entire federal investment was paid for through user fees, the federal vehicle fuel excise tax. Therefore, an interstate railway system could follow that precedent, a 10-year goal, uncompromising 220 mile per hour speed standards, 450 billion in federal investment, state and local partners adding additional funding and implementation input, and all paid for by user fees, passenger rail fares, freight charges, private freight hauler, and private passenger hauler access fees. Few today would express regret that we spent $450 on the interstate highway system. Even fewer will regret in the future that we embarked on the interstate railway system today. Let's give it up for Rob Burns. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm going to send around this handout here. This was actually my handout if everything failed with the projector, but it might be useful to have these on hand. I'll, 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 I'll help you. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you, Tim, for the introduction. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, so many of you are probably familiar with the uh, Path to Prosperity. Some of you may be familiar with the Path to Prosperity presentations I've done before, which was kind of a broad overview of my own work, uh, taking my, my studies of political economy, my PhD studies of political economy, and trying to apply that to policy and to polity, to our constitution, and how, how we should... Uh, how government should be made up based on what I've learned, and that's kind of been the approach that Path to Prosperity for us all takes. And um, for those of you who saw the presentation, I think I first presented that back it's been almost two years now. And if you looked at the website, you would have found uh, just a listing of a, of a uh, federal railway administration and uh, railway traffic controllers, you know, so to kind of mirror the, the aviation uh, Federal Aviation Administration and the, and the Aviation Air Traffic Controllers. Uh, and that was just kind of a, a, a mention. This is one of the things that, that arises out of Path to Prosperity. So I want to talk a little bit about why that is, and, and this is my attempt then excuse me, to look at some of the details. And I think they're very exciting, as I think much of Path to Prosperity for us all is exciting, but I think the de looking at the details. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big picture guy, and I know not everybody is, so I think looking at the, some of the details makes it more interesting for more people. So, um, so let me just uh, look here. I, I, I was thinking, as I presented this, this is a huge project I'm proposing, and I'm just a little guy. But I thought of Daniel Burnham's quote that many of you are familiar with. Make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood, and probably themselves will never be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work, remembering that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, but long after we are gone will be a living thing asserting itself with ever-growing insistency. So, um, so I think that, that helps uh, provide some inspiration. I think I'm going to do some more comparison of this with the interstate highway system, but I, and I did that, you heard from, from Tim in the introduction, I do a little bit of that in the introduction. The, uh, if I were standing here today telling you I want to spend $450 billion to build four-lane 
highways with interchanges all over the country, it would be kind of it would sound like an absurd thing then. And you'll you'll see that as we look at some of the history of the interstate highway system, it sounded absurd to everybody, and yet what we built was so much bigger than anybody was ever even proposing at the time. So uh, I kind of think the interstate railway system might follow a similar path. So let me talk a little bit. This is my logo I, I licensed for Path to Prosperity. Um, let me talk a little bit about the connection then. So Path to Prosperity is, a, is the, the idea that we would retain in government all the inherent governmental powers. And, and you might think, well, of course we should do that. But I, I, my... My assertion is, my, uh, my point is that we are, not, we are not doing that and we have not been doing that for hundreds of years. So slowly we're letting the, the inherent governmental powers be whittled away, and you might call it corruption, you might call it capitalism, you might call it all kinds of things, but it, when, when those inherently governmental powers are wielded by somebody who isn't answerable to us, who doesn't have to adhere to the limits of our constitutional republic, could do whatever they want, you're basically unleashing unlimited government. You're, you're, you know, so you're, and, and oftentimes it's done in the, in the name of making government smaller. So I want to privatize the, uh, the highway system, say, and that will make governmental, government smaller. But I think when you understand it uh, from, you know, the sort of this history of political economy thought, you see that what we're doing is we're not making government smaller, we're changing the form of government from one that is a Republican form, a Democratic form of government, where we get to decide how our commons are constituted and comprised and how they're operated and all that, to a monarchical or despotic form of government where we, where we just hand over those commons to some guy who seemed like the wealthiest in the room, so maybe he must be the smartest too. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the theory that's guided, uh, guided us for so long. And, and a lot of the, the fighting that goes on in government is often over this, should we be, should we be making government smaller at all cost? Kind of the uh, Grover Norquist idea. Um, but even if, if you give Grover Norquist a generous reading, I think uh, he, might, he might come to see the light of this interstate railway system and the interstate highway system. Um, but oftentimes, the idea that if we make government smaller, we have to be careful, not that it's always a bad idea, but we have to be careful that we're not actually privatizing governmental powers. We're not privatizing the control over our commons. And the interstate, uh, our interstate highway system is one example of the commons. Um, and the interstate railway system that I'm proposing would be another enhancement of that commons. So here's, here's where I think we run into problems. We often think of this dichotomy, this false dichotomy between government and the market. Should government provide something or should the market provide it? And what that overlooks is that the government can provide things through the market. In other words, the government can be an actor in the market like everyone else. So the, for instance, the post office. The post office is not subsidized by, by our tax dollars, by our income taxes or corporate taxes or any of those sort of what I call generalized taxes. It's paid for through user fees. So when you buy a stamp, you're paying the revenues that help cover the costs of the post office. And, um, and so there is, there is a market solution provided by government. So if you, if you find yourself trapped in this false dichotomy of either it's the market or it's government, when you're confronted with the post office, you don't know what to think now because, wait a minute, they're selling stamps, which is the revenues for the, this is, that's the commodity sold, and then they're providing that comedy, that commodity through the, you know, hiring labor, hiring postal workers and buying equipment buying trucks off the private market from GM or Chrysler or Jeep or whoever. Uh, and so isn't this a market solution yet, yet it's going. So, I, so you don't want to get trapped. So things can be provisioned not through the market. I'm going to have a skirt stick. How did you want it? Well, our sidewalks, for instance. Uh, it would be kind of hard if we, if we were to provide, to decide we want to provide sidewalks, which I've been staying out in DuPage County, and I can tell you they don't always think sidewalks are that important to provide. but. If you provide sidewalks, it becomes very difficult to, to marketize them, to, to turn them into a commodity and charge the money that, that, for that wear and tear. So some things are difficult to provide as a commodity. And so government may, that might even be the reason we want government to provide it, because no one else can do it. But in the case of these commons, these, and um, we're going to introduce the term natural monopoly commons, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. 
they're not really difficult to provide as a commodity and to provide as a market solution. So we, we can go ahead and encourage government to operate it, to retain it in government because it really is a governmental power, but then to go ahead and provide it as a market solution. Uh, and then there's another dichotomy or another distinction we might make, which is the distinction between private and public. And, and, they, and we have to keep these things separate. So if something is an inherent governmental power, yet it's provided privately, that again gets back to what I was talking about. That's a change in the form of government. If, if I privately wield governmental powers, you should call me a monarch or a despot. You know, that's what, that's what that means to privately, you know, if I'm privately wielding ordinary powers, just, you know, buying and selling, talking to you, answering your questions, that's not a, those aren't governmental powers. So if I do that privately, that's fine. You know, that's, that's non-governmental and it's private. And then there's other things that might be governmental and public, but it's that mixture, you know, it's that oftentimes it's called public-private partnerships, which I think we should be very wary of. Yeah. Where somebody, really, they're just saying, I see that it, it would be very nice for me to wield governmental powers as my own private powers, as my own whims, and so I would really like to, to do that, and so that's where we get corruption. So you buy off your legislators, uh, you buy off your, your governors and your executives and all that, so, so we gotta be careful about that. All right, um, so that brings me to this, uh, why is it that I'm saying that highways are, are inherently governmental powers or a railway? And that gets to this concept in economics called natural monopoly. And a natural monopoly is, it, it, this is the kind of thing, it's, it's in your intro textbook if you ever, you know, if your freshman year you take Economics 101, you're likely to encounter it at the back of the book. Sometimes the teacher won't get to it in time, but uh, if, if, if your teacher does, you'll learn about natural monopoly. And so this is kind of the uh, certain things that we provide, that we can still provide through the market, but they will not, uh, they won't be provided in a competitive way that will tend <clears throat> because of the, the sort of conditions of that market, they will tend towards one provider. They'll tend towards one provider. That doesn't mean there can't be five or 10 providers, and, in, and but they will tend towards one. And oftentimes we'll see two, three, four providers who are dividing up those powers at great expense, but because there's so much benefit, so much efficiency in, in controlling that common, in that natural monopoly, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of that efficiency and power to waste on dividing it up. So the classic example maybe is like Verizon and um, Comcast and AT&T. These are all, all right, you're like three providers, how can that be a monopoly? Well, it is, it is a monopoly in that the, the networks that they provide us, wired networks and wireless networks, those, those things themselves and the routers and the gateways and all this equipment they operate to keep that network going, that part is a monopoly. And yet, if they each provide their own, you think, well, then that's, how is that still a monopoly? Well, they each provide their own because they want to tell us the story that this is not an inherently governmental power, that it's not the commons, but it's really just competing. And the problem is when you compete in these natural monopolies, as if it is a competitive market, not a natural monopoly, it creates a very destructive kind of competition. It's not the kind of competition when you have um, low barriers to entry to the market where anybody can just get in that market and buy and sell as they please. Rather, once that network is provided by one, somebody else comes in, it's very uh, a very ugly kind of competition. You, you try to undermine, you might cut the cables of your competitor, you might you know, do damage in other ways, you, you, you might spend enormous amounts of money on advertising that's, that's just meant to pull the customers from one provider to another provider. And you, you lure in those customers by telling them all kinds of things that you can't possibly, promises you can't possibly keep. And so people switch back and forth. They say, oh, at and has got a great new deal. I switched from Verizon. And you talk to them a year later and they're, they're swearing because uh, it didn't all turn out the way they, they planned it to be. So there's a lot of this switching that goes back and forth. And it's very wasteful in our economy. <clears throat> so for a long time we've settled on the fact that our roadways are provided by the government, and, and every once in a while you kind of see an aspiring monopolist think, well, only if, if only I could control that, how wonderful my life would be. But, uh, but so far that hasn't, that hasn't changed, and people, people have come to accept that, but, the, but we, shouldn't, we shouldn't then accept that railways or, or uh, transport of 
of modulated frequencies, what our broadcast networks, our internet, um, whatever, pipelines. So we know there's all this, this controversy now over the XL pipeline. And these pipelines that are, are 60, 70 years old now are bursting. <coughs> and that's, again, some of the symptoms of these problems I'm talking about when you privatize a common because uh, someone who was very excited to build that pipeline and control that pipeline because it, once you control the pipeline, you can tell everybody who wants to move oil through that pipeline or tar sands through the pipeline exactly what they got to pay you to do it. And you, you basically set the terms because it's the only way to get there. Um, but a lot of times you don't think ahead, you know, so 60 years down the road, they're like, well, we didn't think we'd have to spend money to keep this pipeline from bursting, you know, and so uh, they, they just let it burst. Whereas if you have a public provider, yes, it may, they may spend more money to keep that bursting from happening, but that's because the public wants to avoid, <laughs> you know, oil running down their, their uh, sewer and, and down their sidewalks and through their front yards. <coughs> so... But, uh, then the, but we can also separate. So this natural monopoly is just, what I'm talking about is the networks. The, the, the very you know, core of the network is the natural monopoly part. But you can then separate out all of the competitive things. And if those are provided, this is the, the language used by the progressive era. If you provide those natural monopolies as public utilities, um, you know, governmentally provided public utilities, then they can keep the cost low. They won't gouge the, the people who need to use that network, but they, uh, but it will then allow a flourishing of competitive providers in, in the services that use that network. So for instance, the internet. Right now, our internet is provided to us by Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, and they also provide, they give themselves a very lucrative, privileged position to provide us with phone service and voicemail service and on-demand services and cable television lineups and all of these things that, that they're not really tied in with the network. Obviously, those things need a network, but they don't need AT&T or Comcast or Verizon to tell us, to sell that to us. You know, if, if our internet was provided purely as a public utility, we would have a wide variety of choices over, we could build our own cable lineup, channel lineup, the way exactly as we wanted it, you know, and we might get different channels than our neighbor gets because we're just making it up, you know, to suit ourselves. And so you end up with a lot more choice because you're in a lot more competitive environment and you don't get the destructive uh, competition that goes on, which, I mean, part of the people complain in the U.S. we don't have, uh, we don't have the bandwidth that some other countries have. My, my hunch is, just from the economics of this that I, I know, we probably have loads of bandwidth, but that's being used to deliver Comcast on demand, you know, so that Netflix has to use the regular old bandwidth, Comcast gives themselves a, a huge allocation of bandwidth and makes sure that the movies get to you crystal clear, and, and whereas if you ran it as a public utility, Everyone could take advantage of that crystal clear bandwidth and get their content to you, and you would then have a wider variety. So, you know, a lot of times I hear people talk about, you know, the government overreach and government taxation, government regulation, and I agree with them, but I want to extend that to the, the private providers we've now handed over governmental power. So AT&T is over-regulating us and over-taxing us, and they're doing it, I think, much more than, than our core government where we have taxation, but it's with representation. When you have AT&T taxing you and regulating you, there's no representation. You don't call your your uh, alderman at AT&T and say, hey, I don't like the way you're running this network. I, I'd, I'd like to sell some content to people and have the same benefits that AT&T has when they sell content, or the same benefit Comcast has when they sell content. So in natural monopoly, it, it, it's much better anyway to have this provided as a governmentally provided public utility. And I, I want to stress the governmental because back in the progressive era, a lot of these private monopolists, they, they caught wind of this rhetoric, you know, or a rhetoric that I think is true. And so they started naming things. So, you know, so you talk about people's gas, you know, so it's supposed to be like the people providing us our gas, but it's really a private, you know, so the private enterprise just simply decided we'll call ourselves people's gas. 
the electric company called themselves the Commonwealth Edison. So Commonwealth, just like, you know, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or the Commonwealth of, of uh, what, is, what is the British uh, Empire is now the uh, British Commonwealth, I guess they call it. It's something along those lines. But, you know, so they, they pick up on those, those words. Or American telephone and telegraph, it sounds very patriotic. It sounds very national. And that was meant to appeal to a progressive audience and it kind of emptied the kind of public, the way they were using public of all its meaning. So their Commonwealth Edison will tell you, well, I'm providing a public utility, you know. But that's not what they meant. They meant a governmentally provided utility in that progressive era. So, so that brings me to talk about the interstate highway system and the interstate railway system. So I want to look at the interstate highway system because in the Path to Prosperity stuff, some people, would, some people had asked me, well, it isn't, you know, I present well, the ideas of these are the tenets that the Path to Prosperity asks us to stick to. People would say, well, isn't that socialism? And I would say, well, if it's socialism, I have to ask you two things. I have to ask you, what's your problem with socialism? Because I'm trying to be very specific about what I want. And the second thing is, I think if it's socialism, it's socialism in the same sense that Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and all of those guys were socialists. So they wanted the same things. They had a socialist militia. They had a socialist post office. They had a socialist monetary system. They had a socialist road. They had federal power to administer the roadways. You know, these are all these same socialism that I'm talking about here. So, uh, so I'm socialist in the same sense as, as those founding fathers, those framers of the Constitution. And, uh, and so here I started looking for what kind of governmental projects have adhered to this path to prosperity ideals, these tenets, you know, and I, and I thought, well, the interstate highway system, you know, so I guess I can also say I'm a socialist just like Eisenhower was a socialist, so he, he wanted to see this socialist interstate highway system put through, and that's what, um, that's what I want to do, but with railways. So let me talk a little bit about that. So here's, this is a map of our interstate highway system. You know, this is what I want you to imagine if I'm in 1955 and I'm telling you I want to build highways everywhere, four lanes wide with intersection, interchanges that, no, no traffic lights, there were, you know, clean interchanges, great separated, all of this, all this great stuff, and you look at me like, this is, this is crazy, how could we do this, you know, and yet, 20 years later, much of this had been built, and, uh, <clears throat> but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an easy task, and, and Eisenhower didn't come up with this idea so much, but he really took the leadership role and made sure it happened. The idea had gone back farther, you know, the, the uh, highway trust fund, which funded this, was actually started by Roosevelt in 1934, and it started out at one cent a gallon for gas, so it was, it was only one cent a gallon. Today that tax is now 18 cents a gallon, has not kept pace with inflation, and probably is not high enough to cover the, the depreciation on our highway system. But it's not, it's not so far out of whack. It, it probably should be 30 cents or 25 cents or something like that. But, but it started out at one cent, which today would be 16 cents. So if I adjust it for today's dollars, it's 16 cents a gallon was what our highway trust funds are. And it was not as ambitious. It wasn't, it, it wasn't great separated interchanges that Roosevelt had in mind. He just wanted to beef up the highways that were there, make them stronger. And, uh, and some people said, well, here, now Roosevelt's a socialist because he wants to build highways, you know, so. But we can go back even further. So this is the Cumberland Road. This was uh, begun in, I think, 1820, if I remember the date right. And uh, this was uh, one of the early proposals to build a road, kind of a spine through the, the backbone of, of the nation. And it was supposed to go all the way into Missouri, but they, they, the crash of 1837 hit. And they'd only gotten as far as Vandalia, Vandalia Illinois. Vandalia. Sorry. Vandalia. 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 There you go. Okay. Had only gotten as far as there. <laughs> um, so, and the crash of 1837, you might recognize that date. Uh, that was also the year that Chicago became a city. So at, at, as of 1837, everybody really thought St. Louis, Missouri was going to be the, the big city of the Midwest. And uh, so maybe uh, Chicago benefited somewhat from from that crash in the end. Uh, but there was a lot of struggle over this, this Cumberland Road. Again, you had people all the way back in 1820 saying, no, no, we don't want the government providing roads. I got this idea, I'm just gonna put a turnpike in, just a pike that I can drop down in front of cars, 
and I'll charge them money, and I'll, it'll pay for my road. Because it's, again, if I can control that monopoly, that natural monopoly, that's a very lucrative position to find myself in. And so they were lobbying Congress and, you know, starting political parties and, and all of this to, in order to make sure that, that the government wasn't building these natural monopolies, but they would alone. Oh, that was one thing I wanted to say about the, the Constitution, the, the socialists who founded the United States. They, they, put, they only had the roadways in there, okay? So you might say, well, that's only roadways, you know? But if you think about all of the other networks that I'm talking about, there were no electric grids, there were no pipelines for oil and natural gas, there were no, uh, there was no te telegraph yet. Uh, you know, so there was no wireless broadcasting. You know, so these are these are all things that yeah they didn't include in there. But I think when they put in their roadways that they wanted the government to be the administer of the roadways, that they had in mind. You know, that if you were to properly construct the constitution, construe the constitution to today, you have to see what they had in mind there that they wanted to include those transport networks as a power of Congress. And, and also of the states for their own particular you know, realm. Um, okay, so jumping ahead from, from the Cumberland Road, uh, I want to go to the, uh, what is called the Transcon Transcontinental Motor Convoy. Convoy. How many people have heard of this? Transcon okay, a few people. Yeah. This is, this is part of what shaped Eisenhower. He was very young then, about 20, 29 years old, I think, and he participated in this. Keep in mind, this is about 10 years after cars had become take a, a more popular item. Before that, they were very exclusive thing, and only millionaire, you know, very real wealthy had. So just 10 years after that, the U.S. Army started this convoy across the nation. They, they went from Washington, D.C., and they traveled all the way to San Francisco. And they brought lots of equipment, all that they had, you know, they sort of brought it across those, and they wanted to demonstrate that the roads needed improvement. So they went over bridges, and the bridges would buckle, you know, and they have to repair them, you know, and so they, in their wake, they repaired a lot of stuff, but they wanted to show that we needed a much a stronger infrastructure, and uh, that was kind of the, the idea that, that, so that's 1919. So we, we move ahead to 1934, and they start this highway trust fund at the federal level to help fund states and locales to improve their highways, created the the U.S. highway system, where we designated certain highways for, for federal funding. Uh, and then in 1944, they started looking at, well, how can, what if we made it an interstate highway system? And this was the map produced by the federal government showing how they might connect. And it's very much the, the system that we have today. And these are showing you the population in various cities and towns and how they were going to try to serve that in an equitable manner. Now, think about this is a big difference between public and private provision. If you're a private provider, if you're the one providing the highways, then who cares about equitable, right? I'm just going to build the road where it looks the most profitable. You know, maybe I live there too, so I like to use it, so I build it for myself. So there's all this personal private reasons that I want to build the way I want to build. Whereas if it's governmental, there's a, there's a sense in our Constitution that it has to be equitable, equal protection of the law, and um, due process, and all of these things have to come in even with building our infrastructure. And so that's what they had in mind. You know, they, they thought, we need to build this. That doesn't mean it needs to be equal. It doesn't mean everybody has to have a highway exit you know, a few hundred feet from their door. But we need to lay it out in a way that you know, kind of meets the, the biggest populations, give, you know, meets their demand for, for highway use and the thin populations somehow meet their demand too. I mean, after all, if you move to Montana, you probably don't want to be too close to roads anyway, so, but we need to provide some way to get goods to you and, and help you, let you participate in this national commerce that we all have. <coughs> so, this is a artist rendering from 1945, and this shows you how the standards that they put out were not actually that strong. They were talking still about the possibility of grade intersections and the sort of exits just, you know, to get one way or the other, but not to, not full interchange, not cloverleaf interchanges as we know today. And even then, so in 1934 they were telling, you know, Roosevelt, he was a socialist for wanting to fund highways, 
1945, they were kind of coming to accept it, but saying, this is too much. You're, you're proposing too much. These are too hot. The standards are way too high. We can never meet, build this and, and without going bankrupt. You know, every state, every, every town, every city will go bankrupt if we build to the standards you're talking about. And uh, so that was a lot of struggle. That's why from 1945 to 1956, when Eisenhower kind of really wanted to get things moving, very little had happened. And, and it was going very slow. If we were going to have an interstate highway system at that pace, it would probably be hundreds of years before we saw, we saw it completed. So I, I think it's something to keep in mind as I talk about the interstate railway system, that, that all of these ideas were seen as just the standards were too high, we could never meet that. And I think what it, it also overlooks is just the tremendous power of, of a natural monopoly common, that, which is the reason why certain mono private monopolists want to wield that power, but when we leave it wielded by the public, by the government, it, it, it's a benefit that accrues to us all. And so, just to talk a little bit about the rates here, so we're talking about today, the, the interstate highway system, the highway trust fund, taxes gasoline at 18 cents a gallon. So if you imagine you get, if you're in a vehicle that gets 18 miles to the gallon, you're talking about one cent per mile that goes towards uh, go, goes towards the road that you're driving on. That's how much, you know, if you've got a car that gets better than 18 miles per gallon, then you're talking about even less. So that, that's the fee you're paying. That's the price of the commodity of, the, of our entire highway system that you pay to the federal government. You pay something to the states too, so another cent there maybe. But it's very low. And, and when you think about the estimate of, uh, of spending, on our transportation, if you just the average that someone spends when they drive their car, is about 50 cents per mile. That's the estimate that you know. So when you add up the depreciation of the car, the fuel that goes into it, you know, everything, but not not counting your time spent operating the vehicle, which we, we probably should count, uh, especially if you want to compare it with a railway system where you don't have to spend time. But uh, just adding up the fuel and the depreciation and all that comes to 50 cents, and maybe two or three cents of it is going towards the roadways. So you can imagine it, if, if you built this to the lower standards, you might have saved a penny and a half. And you, you might have actually caused more fuel costs and all this other stuff. So you, you end up saving you know, in one place and end up dumping that cost on somebody else privately. And that, that goes on a lot in a lot of the government disputes. We see that in the healthcare debate. You know, we don't want to keep taxes low. We don't want to tax people for their health care. We want to leave them with private monopolist insurance providers who are just taxing them like out of control. You know, so a lot of times we put right, we keep the cost low in one place, and we end up pushing them up in another. And I think that's what what uh, what we do if we don't build the highways to a, to a good standard. So, imagine, take a look at this picture before I show you the next picture, and. Think of the states, the governors and the mayors and county board presidents and all this saying, look, these standards are too high, we can never build this. And then look at what has been built in in uh, Houston. The Caddy Freeway is, uh, they, they proudly talk about this is 26 lanes with the frontage roads. Uh, Katy Freeway. Caddy, Katy, okay. My pronunciation guru here. Um, so. Excuse me, that's in Houston? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, they built this, and, and so 26 lanes is what's needed. And this is where I want to kind of get at some of the problems, some of the deficiencies of the interstate highway system plan where it went wrong. I think it did a lot right, but it made some mistakes too. And, and the fact that we have, we've ended up with something like this, when it was thought that this was too much, and now we happily and proudly boast about, about this. Or here's another one, this is called the, the El Toro Y, which is in Los Angeles, where the 5 and the 405, I believe it is, come together. And this is 26 lanes without frontage roads. So this is two highways joining together 20, at 26 lanes, and then eventually they merge, and it becomes, you know, a decent, you know, 14 lanes or something like that later. And you can imagine, once they built this, I'm sure you all heard about this, all of the traffic problems in L.A. have ended. So... <laughs> But no, it hasn't, of course. But so we're we're almost on this this uh, hamster wheel as we try to build more highways and build more lanes, and and we don't even second guess it. Whereas before we said 
four lanes is too much. So here's a, a big dig in Boston, another example of a large project. Now this, again, raises the standards quite a bit, because now not only are you building a, you know, many lanes, but you're putting it all underground, and that, of course, has a much higher cost. But as an economist, I want to look, a lot of, look at these costs in a closer detail, because I think when we do that, we're going to find that we should shoot for even higher standards, probably. Uh, I just was re recently watching the movie I, Robot. Has anybody seen that movie? It's uh, uh, based on the book uh, I, Robot by... Uh, Isaac, Isaac Asimov. Asimov. Thank you, Isaac Asimov. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's set in Chicago. I don't know if the book is set. I didn't read the book. But I, the, the movie's set in Chicago. And a lot of the highways they go on are underground. So they go on the interstate highway. So they're kind of I'm envisioning a future where they've all been buried. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that would be a bad thing or a good thing, but it, it might be worth thinking about. But I also think if we move to interstate railway, we might start to see an opportunity to shrink our highways, to, to reduce the lanes. And that's really what I think the, the major aim should be eventually. And certainly at least to stop the expansion. You know, we don't want to go 26 lanes everywhere. Progress. So, this interstate railway system I'm talking about, I'm talking about a conventional steel wheels on steel rails. And, but I, before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about maglev, because I think it's an interesting technology. And the reason I, the reason I want to focus on this is, the, the high speed rail I'm talking about is, uh, is basically 50 years proven technology. This has been commercially operated in Japan as the Shinkansen since, since 1960. And uh, the TGV, which kind of learned a lot from the Shinkansen, they added some new stuff since 1980, and they've actually been upping their standards a little bit here and there as they go. So they're even getting higher standards. And we're talking about trains that go 220 miles per hour, routinely reach that speed. They don't average, obviously, that, but that's the, uh, the top speed. <coughs> but let me look at maglev a little bit, because I think it's, a, it's an interesting technology. I, I don't count it as proven. There's one maglev line built commercially, and it's in China, um, in Shanghai. And it just goes from their airport to downtown. I think it's about 18 miles long. I'm kind of remembering this off the top of my head. So it doesn't, it's not long enough for the maglev. The maglev actually accelerates and decelerates faster than, than rail. I'll talk about why that is, the conventional rail. But even though it does accelerate and decelerate faster, the 19 miles isn't long enough for it to reach a top speed, its top design speed of 300 miles per hour. It only reaches 268 miles per hour in the middle. And it, it's a comfortable ride, you know, you don't, you don't feel like you're being slammed against the, the back or slammed forward, but uh, it's just a comfortable acceleration and deceleration. Um, and this is what it looks like in the station. Here's what it looks like leaving the airport. This is only in China, this is only in Shanghai. Um, Japan is working on their own system. This one is the most proven. This has been a, they've been demonstrating these for decades, uh, 40, 30, 40 years. Um, the idea goes back even further to the 1920s uh, when it first dawned on somebody that you could float a train on a magnetic field <laughs> and move it that way. Um, but it's, a, it's also a very expensive construction, but I want to break down that cost structure and why maybe we shouldn't worry about it, too much about it being very expensive, but, or where we should worry about it being expensive and where we shouldn't. This is uh, another approach. Uh, you can see that very high standards. It's, it's you know, above grade, well above grade for quite a bit of the ride, um, and you know, very high standards of construction. This shows you... Uh, what the maglev looks like kind of in a profile. This is what they call at grade. So even when you're at grade, there's about a meter gap between the ground and the, the bottom. And the interesting thing about that is, I, I think from an environmental perspective, I, I was a green candidate for Congress, so that's very important to me. But that means that most wild animals can move underneath there, except for the largest, uh, can move even when that's at grade. So that's an interesting thing to me. Um, it's, it uses less energy. If, if you run it at the same speeds as conventional rail, it uses less energy because there's less friction involved and uh, there's less weight. It doesn't, it doesn't rely so much on weight to keep it on the track the way conventional rail does, so you can make it a lightweight train. 
which is, is held in place by the magnetic field. And this is, uh, this is an Issei train in Germany. This is the standard way that high-speed rail, conventional high-speed rail, gets its power from an overhead catenary cable and a pantograph that, that re reaches up to grab it. And uh, those are usually, now with high-speed rail, these are often at like 25,000 volts. Uh, to, as for a comparison, I think the L, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think it's about 800 volts. You know, on the third rail is 800 volts, this is 25,000 volts in that cable. So I, I, I'm not a train, I, I'm a train buff, but not like some of you I know. So uh, I may get some of this stuff wrong, but feel free to correct me in the rebuttal. Um, <clears throat> this gives you an idea of, uh, of how that works so that the there's magnets there that levitate the train that keep it above the concrete platform. And there's other magnets that guide the train so that it keeps it from rubbing alongside the concrete. So there's really no friction there. The, the, the only friction is the wind friction, the resistance that you get from, you know, aerodynamic resistance you get from any vehicle. But there's nothing between the ground and the, and the train. This is a nice comparison, I think give you an idea that why, why I think it's important to talk about maglev a little bit, even though it's not a fully proven technology. But here you see on the, on the left, this is where, uh, this is how conventional rail works. Its propulsion is through a motor that drives the axle. The guidance is through the, the shape of the rail and the shape of the wheel. The uh, support or is you know coming from the rail upwards and the traction is the steel wheel on that steel rail. And so Maglev gets to, in this new technology, gets to improve a lot upon a lot of that. So its, it's power transfer actually occurs through uh, an, just the electromagnetic field. Um, it, it just, it, it, like a generator, if you imagine a generator spins a ma magnet through a coil, if you just unwrap that coil, that becomes the rail that the Maglev train is running on. And so as it moves, it just basically transfers electricity to the train without any contact. And so I, I think that's a technology that maybe we could bring to conventional rail too, because one of the big costs of operation is the friction that wears away that catenary cable and the pantograph uh, contacts to that. Uh, so if we could make that contactless, you could imagine a conventional rail, high-speed rail, which starts off, drops its pantograph down when it reaches a certain speed, and then just receives all the power it needs right from the from the induction underneath it. I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but that, that would be a promising way to look. Um, and then other people are talking about using some of this maglev technology. The maglevs, because they're very flexible, you can, you can add as much traction as you need, you know, so one of the advantages of uh, conventional rail is the steel wheels on the steel rails, that also leaves very little friction, not, not compared to maglev, but say compared to an to a automobile, automobile with rubber tires on an asphalt surface. There's a lot more friction there than there is in a steel wheel on a steel rail. Um, but that also means that that limits how quickly the train can accelerate and decelerate. And maglevs don't have that problem because they use their traction is provided by this magnetic field and you can up that as much as you want. So the limit on acceleration and deceleration is really the comfort of the passengers inside. It's not, it's not the technology itself that's limiting that acceleration. And then same thing with slopes. So the nice thing about maglevs is they can match the slopes of uh, the inclines of our interstate highway system, for instance, which is much greater incline than you can get with a conventional rail system. But again, if you could bring this maglev technology right alongside the train, you could, you could kind of boost that train at certain spots and, and uh, bring it up mountains at a, at a higher incline uh, than, than otherwise it could. All right, so. All right, so let me look a little more, some of the details though, going, getting back to conventional rail. So, um, so I'm talking about, again, uh, the interstate railway system with the high-speed rail as one component, one part of that. So the other part is the heavy freight rail system, which I basically think of as the class one railways we now have. So 
those would continue, and they would carry, you, you would basically li limit the high-speed rail, the axles on that would be limited to a particular weight, and the, the overall train maybe to a particular weight, so that, so that you wouldn't damage the system as much, and, and, it, and you could also travel at the high speed and not get in the way of other trains traveling at high speed. So if you were carrying coal and all these other heavy, heavy things, you would still go to the, to the more conventional lower speed rail. But, um, oh, and the, and the high speed rail, I want to break into both express lines and, and local lines to kind of mirror that, you know, our highway system has four lanes, so you have two of them each direction for express and two of them for local. But with the train, we can be a little even more flexible with it than that. <coughs> and it helps improve safety, too. So, um, so this is the a map of the Class One railways in North America, or focusing on the U.S. So uh, that's uh, what they look like. Quite a quite a few. Again, this is the interstate highway system that we have today, and, and I would then mirror that. I want to take the same corridors and match them corridor for corridor with a high-speed rail and match exit for exit with a, with a station in an urban center near that exit, you know, so that we actually serve the, the, right into the downtown or the, the central center part of even towns at each exit. Uh, and I think we should think about international co uh, cooperation in this too and try to involve Mexico and Canada in this as well. And so I show these kind of extending into Canada and, and into Mexico. In my, uh, in my congressional campaign in 2010, I actually had a proposal for what I called a, a uh, Marshall Plan for North America. So I wanted to do what we did for Europe, but do it for ourselves, because I think we're overdue. Um, and so the idea would be to, to help, help lift Canada and Mexico up at the same time and also build up our infrastructure. And as we get into the economics of it, you'll, you'll see a little more why I was proposing that. This is a TGV train in France. The TGV is literally trains of great speed, if you translate it literal to English. Uh, and that's basically, there's also a double-decker one. I don't have a picture of that, but uh, a duplex uh, train, like kind of like the metro trains we have here. This is a Shinkansen in Japan. That first train that I started with at the beginning of the slide, that was a Shinkansen train, a Japanese built train in China. So China is actually buying their, a lot of their technology from Japan. Um, and Japan is, you know, aggressively trying to sell their technology all around the world, and so as is the TGV, uh, the French uh, operator. And so this is an idea of what uh, interstate railway would look like, oftentimes anyway. You have the two lines in the middle, which would be express in each direction. So you, you limit the, the chance of, of, of collision, because the dedicated one direction all the time. Uh, and then the, the local lines would often be next to the express lines, but they would also veer off and, not, and go to the central city, the central towns nearby and then come back to join the, the, uh, <coughs> the express lines. So express lines would be 220 miles an hour, the uh, top speed, and that would be the typical speed. The, the only reason you would drop down below 220 miles per hour would be to switch to the local, and the locals, uh, the TGV switches basically require about 100 miles an hour, so you have to drop from 220 down to 100 miles an hour before you can switch to the local track. and then you'd be on the local track till you reach your station. So it, it normally takes, I think, if I remember this right, about four miles to do that, to go from 220 down to 100. <clears throat> What's that? Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, and then it takes another four miles, maybe, to go from 100 miles down to the, to the, uh, to a stopped position. So the, the idea, what I'm thinking, is that these switches and the arrangements of them would be in, in place so that you could steadily do that. You would just drop from 220 down to 100 and make the switch drop down to zero and you'd end up at the station you're looking for and make your way back to the next switch to uh, up to 100 miles an hour and switch on to 220. So um, this is a computer rendering from the California High Speed Rail Project. This is the, the project that's underway right now. I mean, I don't know if they've reached the point of no return, 
you never know with the oil interests in our legislatures when uh, they can pull the plug on something like this, but the, they are moving ahead with this, and this is the kind of, just a computer rendering, I don't know if this is an actual bridge, but this was a kind of a hypothetical, showing you the wind power behind it. You know, I, I like to say this is what a sustainable infrastructure would look like. You'd have, you could have wind power powering much of the, the, the electricity for the train. This is another computer rendering from the California High, High Speed Rail Project, and this is just a possible station. I think this is one for the Toronto airport outside of Los Angeles. This is, uh, back to highways a little bit, but I, I think this would be something important to incorporate in. This is a, what's called a fauna crossing or a, a wildlife crossing. Uh, and this allows, I mean, this is for a roadway here, but I'm thinking of the same thing for the train, allow animals that periodically cross over either above or below, because obviously when you're moving 220 miles per hour, you don't want, you don't want animals crossing through uh, the path. Where is this particular one, Rob? This one's in... Uh, this one's in, I think, in Holland, if I remember right. This one, I think, is in North America, but I can't remember what state. But it was like Northern Plains, uh, you know, Northern Rockies, uh, Montana, or something like that, I think. <clears throat> this is a... Uh, I should show you this first. This is the before. This is, a, this is more renderings from the California High Speed Rail Project. This is... Uh, a train line that's a single freight line that's running through a town in California somewhere and what the project proposes to do is to drop that down into a trench and so you still have the, the freight line closest to me and you have two uh, express lines high speed uh, next to it and you can imagine what that does is it it not only improves the train service, but it also improves the car service, you know? So we, I think we, we also need to start to think more and more about combining our infrastructure, our, our transport networks into a single unified whole, where we have intermodal stations that let us move from one to the other, park our cars, get on a train, move to a bus, all these things, but also, you know, when we're spending money to invest on this particular bridge uh, here, to build this bridge, this is benefiting both the automotive traffic and the train traffic. So, This is a TGV, or what they call LGV, uh, lines of great speed in the literal translation. This is what the French refer to to differentiate from other lines because a TGV train can travel on a variety of different tracks. It can travel on conventional tracks. As long as it's got electricity overhead, it can travel on it. Um, and it, it can change the voltage even. It goes into Italy and it goes on a different voltage. And they basically just pull a lever, one pantograph drops down, they push another one forward, and the other one goes up. And, it, and they just coast from one, from the 25,000 volts to the 10,000 volts and, and catch that and keep moving. So uh, it's very versatile. This is called an LGV, a line of great speed. So these are the, the lines that I'm talking about building everywhere that, for this 220 mile per hour express lines. And these are built to the highest of standards, the continuous welded steel rail on a nice bed of ballast, gravel. The, the curves uh, all need very strict details. Just like our highway system, you know, we, we don't do sudden curves or sudden turns. You know, on the, on the LGV lines, you can count on a steady curve that'll let you maintain the 220 mile per hour speed and a steady incline that won't also hinder you you maintaining top speed. This is in Germany. This is, uh, this is an autobahn that runs from, I think, uh, Nuremberg to Munich. And they're building, this is kind of the same idea of what I would imagine look, it looked like in the United States. They're building a high-speed line built to high standards right alongside the, the high-speed highway, the, the autobahn. And of course, the autobahn, you know, has no, no speed limit. But, uh, but the cars themselves can't reach 220 miles per hour for the most part. So, uh, and when they do, it's not as safe. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that because the, the safety is another thing, another enormous advantage. And in these 53 years now of experience in Japan, zero fatalities. They've had some accidents. I think, I think the only accident was, uh, was it with an earthquake. So the earthquake had basically separated the rails 
from themselves, and the train derailed, and there were zero fatalities. So uh, it's, it's quite an amazing technology uh, for safety's sake. And in, and in uh, France, I think there has been a fatality, but it was like a terrorist attack on the train. A bomb exploded. Um, so it's not tied to the core technology. You can see the uh, relative sharpness of the curve of the highway and the broader curve from the railway alignment. What's that? You can see the relatively sharp curve for the highway compared to the broader curve for the railroad alignment. Yeah, it does look like they're straightening it a little bit there. So, so let me talk a little bit about the cost. So this is the economist in me. I want to think about these costs. We often just think about well, how much is it going to cost us, you know? And I think, especially for government, they need to think in more detail. Because for a, for a regular old private enterprise, whether it's competitive or a monopolist, you know, they're just concerned about the overall cost. What's it going to cost me? But with government, we have to think in terms of public policy. What, what should, and so there are very different costs involved. One of them, as an environmentalist, is very important to me, the natural resource costs. What, is, what are we doing to the earth in order to keep this infrastructure in place, you know? And I think that's, that's one reason I look at the interstate highway system and, and I wonder whether it's sustainable. You know, it, it's not going to be, it's not gonna stay the way it is forever. It's gonna have to be upgraded, replaced, you know, or at the very least replaced, you know, in, in place to keep it going for what it is. And so that, that means more concrete, more asphalt, and we constantly have to replace that. So rail, I think, has some interesting benefits on that side. Uh, the, the, there's the right-of-way cost, you know, so there's the actual, we need a little bit of space to put two tracks or four tracks or five tracks or however many are going to stretch between these cities and towns. And so that, that to me, I think, is the, the biggest concern. Can we really afford to add another basically double the, the right-of-way that's there now for our interstate highway systems. Not, not the 26 lanes, I think we're gonna reduce those. In our cities, I think we'll reduce the right-of-way. In the, the between cities, intercity, interurban, interstate, we, we're going to basically double that width. You know, that four lanes will become like eight lanes, basically, because we're gonna add four tracks um, that weren't there before. Um, then there's the issue of labor. So there's labor costs, but in an economy like ours where we're way below full employment and there are lots of construction workers, for instance, who are not employed, you know, that's where I think government needs to look at, well, we should be making sure that we have full employment. That's that one of the key things our government should do. Um, and so if we are at full employment, then maybe it's time to back off the project a little bit, you know, slow down of the development of the interstate railway system. But if we are, at full, we're, we're not at full employment, if we have people left out of work, let's go ahead and put them back to work. And so I, I think we can almost put a line right through that labor. You know, just, it's not a cost if, if we don't have everybody working who wants to work, you know. So, um, <clears throat> then there's the issue of know-how. And again, these are, these are lessons I'm bringing in that, that I've kind of come to through my work in Path to Prosperity for us all. So know-how is, is a major cost. So like if you go with the TransRapid, that's a, a conglomerate, a, a joint project of Tyson and Siemens in Germany. And uh, they've spent decades doing that, but uh, they have a lot of know-how and you'd want to bring them in if you were going to build a TransRapid with Maglev in the United States. Uh, but again, it's, it's a distributional cost. It's not, it's, somebody's getting that money and then we're giving it up. So it's, it's kind of like moving it from one hand to the other. So the question, again, from a public policy point of view is, are we granting too much <clears throat> distributional leeway in our patent system and in our copyright system? That's a separate thing. Or, or will, if, you, if we tell TransRapid, we want to build an entire interstate railway system, will they be so excited to just cut us a great deal? You know, because if the United States builds one, they're going to be able to use that know-how again and again you know, and sell it elsewhere. So. <clears throat> Then there's the, the customary rate of return. Um, and this is, I think, where government falls down a lot. On these commons, in our, our interstate highway system, if you're not including the customary rate of return in there, just from an economics perspective, you're essentially subsidizing somewhat that common. So our interstate highway system, we should expect it to turn a little bit of a profit. Not a lot. We don't want to gouge like a private monopolist would do. But we should expect it to turn a little bit of profit and put that right into the public treasury and then you're, you can tell Grover Norquist to get excited because we're going to drop taxes because we're, we're paying for that through, uh, through our highway system. 
And, and the reason for that is, again, it's an environmental concern. You want to you make sure people are paying the full social cost of what they're using. And if you're not including that customary rate of return that, that all commodities sort of enjoy, you're basically saying, oh, skip that. We'll, we'll skip that for you. And why, you have to ask the question, if we're going to subsidize something, why are we subsidizing? We should always be asking that. I think we end up subsidizing a lot of things we shouldn't be subsidizing. Uh, take, for example, the, the recent sequester cut that it hit the aviation industry. This is another area from an economist's perspective. There's no reason that, that general taxes should be covering our aviation. It, you know, if a plane's landing and it needs air traffic control, well, that plane landing should pay, the landing fees should pay for the full air traffic control, you know, so. It, we, and it, with a little bit of customary rate of return that reduces our taxes, too. So we're basically subsidizing air travel, which is an enormous carbon gas, you know, greenhouse gas emitting uh, industry. And it's not that I want to stop people from flying, but let's not pay them to fly is basically what subsidizing is doing. So uh, customary rate of return and then interest. Well, but if we're already including the customary rate of return, the interest is also just a distributional thing. So that's just a matter of debt. So we're already saying we're going we're gonna to make 10% interest off of this, 10% profit off of this endeavor, this interstate railway system endeavor. And with, as, a monop as a natural monopoly common operator, you have a lot of leeway in what you set the price and how much you pull in, which is why you want it to be public, not governmental and not private. Or governmental and not democratic government, not despotic government, I guess. <laughs> Put it that way. So the interest is really just a matter of our debt service. You know, if we're going to if we're going to finance it through debt, which I think we should, um, well then we're going to pay a little bit of interest on that. But the federal government pays such low interest, oftentimes negative in, uh, real interest rates. You know, so again, people are saying, "Here, take my money, and I'll pay you for it." And there, you want to just invest, invest, invest. So they're basically telling us, "Build an interstate railway system." I think is the hint. <coughs> so these are the these are the breaking down those costs. I, th I think that what it, the top two really end up being the most important ones, the natural resource use and the, the right-of-way, how much right-of-way we use. So, and I think railway system is going to help us in both of those. And then I think we often don't separate the, the different components of the, of the system, too, and think about those costs independently. So, for instance, when you build a foundation, that often lasts 100 years. You know, if, if you lay down rails or you lay down pavement, that might be 20 years, 30 years if you're lucky. And so if you're going to figure out how much it costs, you have to, every 30 years you're going to replace that pavement, every 30 years. But if you put it on a foundation, it might last 100 years for a bridge, say, well then you only have to replace that foundation after 100 years go by, and you shouldn't consider the cost. You shouldn't make everybody pay for that foundation who use it today, and then basically comp everybody 80 years down the road and don't have to pay for it. So you want to kind of share those costs equally. Or for instance, excavation. So this goes to the Big Dig project. It was very expensive to excavate that, to move all that soil out of the way and put those roadways under there. But that excavation, again, will last a long time. And it may make the pavement last longer, because now you're not salting and, and plowing pavement because it's underground. So I think, I think our accounting, we, the accounting standards we apply to our government are, are basically in the toilet. And it's kind of an upside down, topsy-turvy world where they're telling us, which they should, you know. If you're running a business, you have to keep track of the depreciation to the to the letter, you know. But the government, with using our funds, should should hold itself to an even higher standard, and it should be tracking its depreciation in greater detail than anybody could afford to do on their own. And I think that's what we don't get. So the interstate highway system didn't even do any of this. It didn't calculate these depreciations. It just tried to pay for it all at once. It didn't borrow anything necessarily. And it, I want. To, what I'm saying is from an economics point of view, you want to borrow money because you don't want everybody to have to pay for it up front. It makes it look uh, like it's too expensive. It's too, it makes it look like the standards are too high when you should be sharing the payment of that uh, infrastructure over the entire life of that infrastructure. So then when you put the two together, you have to look at, okay, what's the, what's the with the foundations, what's the natural resource use in the foundation? And, the uh, right of way, obviously there's no right of way per se with the foundation, the labor that goes into building the foundation and so on and so forth. Or for the, for example, the excavation, there's really not a natural resource use unless you think of like, or, or a tunnel for instance, there's no natural resource use unless you think of the, the damage you've done to the mountain that you've tunneled through. I don't, I mean somebody might make that argument, I don't see that as a major cost. We're going to extract something, we need to get through the tunnel, we need to get through the mountain so we tunnel through it. 
and whatever we get out of it is kind of free natural resource, you know, that was in our way anyway, so now we have rock, you know, we have ballast maybe to use elsewhere. So when you look at this in, in great detail, I think that the costs become much less of a concern, and we want to shoot for even higher standards and do that through a careful accounting, so we know what the depreciation is on everything, but uh, we don't want to not do that careful accounting and then fool ourselves into thinking it's all too expensive and not do it, not do it right. Um, so these are the heavy, for the heavy freight, I'm talking about let's nationalize them. So again, separating the, the natural monopoly common, the transport network from the, the non-part, the competitive part, nationalizing means you nationalize the rails and the rail beds, but you don't nationalize the freight haulers. So BNSF might continue as a freight hauler, they just wouldn't be relegated to a particular region of the country, they would move their freight across the interstate railway system wherever they please, and they would just do just like a plane does now with air traffic control, with the rail traffic control, you would request, I need to travel I need to travel from this point to this point, when can I go? You know, and they would say, Okay, you get on there and go, you know. And so it it, it actually eliminates the need for regulation. Like right now we have all this regulation that goes into the railways. But the reason we have to regulate them is because we've given them these governmental powers and then we try to use regulation to get them to behave, you know, it's, it, I kind of like to compare it to households. If you were living in a house and you, instead of building your own kitchen or hiring a contractor to build the kitchen you said, you would instead pay some guy to take over your kitchen and then you would try to coax him to get the kitchen just how you wanted it, you know, so it, it's, it's kind of an absurd way to do it and that's kind of what I think regulation does most of the time, is you hand over the governmental powers and then you try to coax that monopolist to do what the public wants them to do and it's kind of absurd. So if you separate those, if the government merely runs the rails as a public utility, the freight haulers and the passenger haulers, anybody can be, just like somebody can become a truck driver, all you have to do is get a loan and buy yourself a, a tractor a truck. Uh, you could become a railroader just by buying yourself a locomotive, you know, and then you would just make arrangements to attach cars to it. And, it, and the government might even help provide the exchange, the the communication system that let you, and the market that let you tie those cars to your locomotive and, and then schedule a time to move them. So it, it becomes a much more competitive environment. Um, so that we nationalize the, the class one railways, upgrade the tracks and the rail beds. Uh, electrification, I put down, I should put a tire, but I want to electrify those too, because once we electrify it, it becomes much more versatile. We don't have, we're not stuck on diesel but we can use any electrical energy, any fuel source for that electrical energy. Um, and it, you'll, you'll find electrification of freight in a lot of European countries in Asia and even in Africa. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's mainly been the oil conglomerates have kept that from happening in the, in the United States. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. We'll try to move a little quicker here. So we'll borrow a little bit from the TGV, LGV, but obviously it's not going to go 220 miles per hour. Um, and, the, and here's the high-speed standards. So the precision materials and construction, electrification at 20 or 30,000 volts, supposed to be 30,000. Uh, In-cap wireless signaling. That's the big advantage. That's the big innovation of high-speed rail. It, it, other than the electrification and the precision laying of the rails. The key thing was to have a wireless technology that could transmit the signals into the get dashboard of the train. Because if you if you waited to see the signal down the track, you it would be too late, you know, because you're moving at 220 miles per hour. So that's the big advantage. Um, we go curve radii standards and banked curves, incline decline standards like LGB, TGB, uh, high speed switches at 100 miles per hour. Um, so it's serving all the interstate highways, as I already said, and all the urban areas near interstate highway system exits. So we bring a train right into the center. Um, station siting for uh, conservation. So that we're not, we're not going to put these stations out in kind of peripheral areas and build parking, large parking, sees of parking lots, but rather bring them right into the city and into the town centers so that people can basically walk there and uh, use other existing infrastructure, uh, and also including national and state park, multimodal centers, airports, and other, elsewhere. Um, High-speed route interchanges, so you can move from, say, the Railroad 55 interstate to the Railway 80 interstate without slowing down much. Um, let's 
see, I talked about a lot of this already. I just, just give you an example. This is like, I just took an example of the Interstate 55. I'm calling it R55 here for the rail. And so just stretching from Chicago towards Springfield. And I'm going to focus on uh, Dwight in the middle there. Uh, it's kind of dark, but uh, this is right there. Um, so the, I've got uh, the express lines, the local lines, and there's already a, a track for freight. So we want to make sure we maintain all that. And this is Dwight here. All right. So I kind of put a black box there because I want to focus on this idea of federalism. The federal government's going to lay out some standards that they demand upon. And then when you get to the local level, they're going to have guidelines that say, here's what you could, we would like you to do. And it'll be up to the local to decide. So Dwight would decide what to do, but they might decide to just pull the locals right off of and bring it right into town that way, or that would allow another local to go to another nearby urban center near that exit, because that's an interstate highway exit there. But more likely, they would bring it right through. The, there's an existing freight rail, and it, Amtrak uses this today. Um, comes right through the center of town there, stops at a station that's, uh, it's got, right now it's at grade, but the system would, the interstate railway system would break that, would excavate and make that uh, grade separated uh, system just like I showed you before. Um, and this is a station built, uh, designed by Henry Abbs Cobb in 1891. Interesting old station that you could keep and, and basically those tracks would be moved from the surface. You could put them underground or put them in a trench, put them underground, make a park. Uh, I'm going to kind of move through this quickly because we're running out of time. Um, this is just Chicago, looking at Chicago. So this is an interesting one because we have, I think, 10, if you count them, we have 10 approaches of interstate highways. So there would be 10 approaches of interstate railways. Basically, uh, we have three interstates that pass right through, so that gives you six approaches from each direction. And then we have four additional. And that's not even counting I-39 and I-43, which also come nearby. So it makes an interesting example. So what I'm suggesting is that every approach to a metropolitan area would have at least one station, maybe two, uh, in the suburban peripheral areas. But again, those would be in, in the city centers, in the suburban center, uh, not often some you know, different place uh, along the highway or something like that, but in the sur suburban center. Um, and this shows you how there's basically two auxiliaries, like auxiliary highways, that most of these are just the federal funding would pay for that unless we needed more track. Uh, and those would bring in auxiliaries to bring the trains right into the city center or to bring uh, trains uh, that want to switch to I-94, Railroad 94, uh, kind of bring them around that way. Um, oh wait, but I, want, and then I also want to talk about the uh, commuter rail. So this shows you how we might integrate it in with commuter rail so that you're not trying to cover it the interstate railway system isn't trying to provide commuter rail service to the city of Chicago. It's just simply trying to integrate with what's there. So basically we'd add a bunch of stations, one for each uh, approach, but right along uh, existing commuter rail service to help tie that in. Um, I, we can kind of skip past this. This is, this is my idea. This is uh, Union Station in Washington, D.C. This was Daniel Burnham's he says that he, he actually designed this with the central station in Chicago in mind, you know, the, the one that was supposed to go next door to the Field Museum between, on Roosevelt Road between Lakeshore Drive and Michigan Avenue or so. Um, so I was thinking the same thing, we might put a central, new central station right on Roosevelt Road between uh, Canal Street and Clark somewhere, you know, somewhere along that, and tie it in with commuter rail and uh, a new kind of loop underground, that kind of thing. Um, but these are just kind of examples. This might, this is a, actually Berlin train station, but this is, I thought, might look like a suburban one that integrates with commuter rail. Um, these are the approaches. I'm going to skip through this because I want to leave time for the rebuttals. Oh, one of the things I'm talking about, too, is it's tying it in with all the major airports. So an interesting byproduct of this project, just as I'm proposing it, is that we end up with express trains between downtown Chicago and O'Hare and downtown Chicago and Midway and between Midway and O'Hare just by the following the guidelines of the, of the project. And so I'm thinking, okay, so we might put a station underground right beneath the uh, people mover terminus. So you'd basically get off the train, take an escalator elevator upstairs and get on the people mover and head to your terminal and vice versa. 
So again, it's not about like choosing trains over planes or automobiles, but creating a system that works well together and gets people where they need to go at the lowest cost and, and lowest environmental cost as well. Uh, so, Midway, similar thing. I'm frustrated that the, the CTA station was built far away from the terminal, so I propose that we fix that along with it <laughs> um, and put uh, the high-speed rail station right underneath the, the terminal along with the new CTA station. Um, National parks, this is just a national park example. Cuyahoga National Park in Cleveland um, is right here. Uh, and it, I-80 I runs right through it, so it would be very simple to simply add. This is this purplish line is the uh, Cuyahoga Historic Railway uh, that runs now through the park. So it would be a very simple thing to just add a station right alongside the, um, the, the Cuyahoga Historic Railway, and you'd switch right to that. Uh, so I'm going to skip through these other national parks, but uh, this is to Grand Canyon, already existing, much the way Amtrak does it already. Uh, Yosemite used to have its own railway, but it was taken down in the 1940s, I think. Um, but I was thinking that we might even just build this, and this might be a great way to try out the maglev, is build a maglev that didn't necessarily travel at top speed, but went through the park, and it, you get all the great environmental advantages and, and low energy costs of maglev that would run through all of these national parks stretching through California. Um, and, then, and then I wanted to show a little bit about the environmental, and then we can open it up to questions. So here's, a, this is just a parking lot, but you might see the same thing on an interstate. This is the condition the concrete gets in. And this is getting back to those natural resource costs. And concrete, is a can be a very expensive thing that um, that also emits greenhouse gases. Even if we were able to switch to completely non greenhouse gas emitting energy, the the process of creating cement for concrete emits greenhouse gases. So um, we got to think about that. Even if if we get really serious about greenhouse gas emissions, and so the problem is you get to this point with the concrete, and the next thing you got to do is turn it into this. And so it's, it's a very wasteful process. If you think about the life of the interstate highway system, it's, uh, it involves a lot of this. And it just gets a little bad and you've got to replace it all. Versus, uh, if you look at this again, the French LGV line, these are concrete railroad ties. Most of them can be reused. If, if it gets a little bad, you basically relay the rails. The rails themselves are uh, steel, very highly recyclable. Uh, the ballast might need to be upgraded, but updated. Uh, from time to time, but uh, but it doesn't have the problems of concrete. So I think environmentally, if we were to have to choose one technology, we would want to pick the rail over the uh, over the uh, high speed high uh, I'm sorry the paved ways. We pick the railways over the paved ways. And I think for a lot of other reasons, the safety concerns I mentioned, environmental concerns, the cost concerns, because those environmental concerns will have cost. Uh, implications in, in, the, in the long run as we have to replace the highway system. That we can actually keep those urban right-of-ways, we can recover urban right-of-ways that we've lost to the Dan Ryan Expressway or the Kennedy because we had to make them so wide. Because we can reduce trips and we can reduce trip distances through rail. Um, and, um, and, I, and again, the greenhouse gas, let me, let me just close on that. This issue of greenhouse gases, a lot of times people talk about, let's put a carbon a tax on carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. The problem is that expects people to find their own way, their own alternatives. And if you're talking about infrastructure, we don't find our own alternatives. You don't say, well, I'm not happy with the, the highway system, so I'll just have my own interstate highway system. That, that's something we do have to do together publicly. And so the, way, the only way we can raise taxes on carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions high enough is to also provide an alternative, and railway, I think, does that. It provides a great alternative where we could have potentially zero greenhouse gas emissions. Doesn't rely on batteries the way electric vehicles do, um, and so it's just better overall environmentally. So, all right, I'll stop there. Magnet works. I assume there's no wheels on those things. Uh, it's just 
Yeah. That is basically a magnetic rail gun that's <clears throat> flying down the flying down the road. Yeah, there, there's different designs. Like I said, the Japanese are working on their own design, um, but the Trans Rapid, which I said is the most promising and has already been proven in some ways, it uh, it's always levitated. So even when even when it stops, it has batteries on board to keep it levitated, and it uses about the same power they say to levitate it that it takes to run the hotel, what they call the hotel power, the lights and the air conditioning and the heating. And use about the same amount of power just to keep it levitated. If it loses power, it's able to sort of, through regenerative braking as it slows down, ah. it, it's able to generate enough electricity to get it down to six miles per hour, and at that point it drops down in what it calls skids, and it skids to, to a stop. But it doesn't skid at 220 miles an hour. No, or three, <laughs> 300 miles per hour at stop speed. All right, we're just real quick, he's gonna, our speaker's also going to handle the questions tonight so I can film you with no trouble. So go ahead. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a, a silly question. Loud, loud please. Are you related to the Scottish poet Robert Burns? My brother has been working on our ancestry and he's trying to figure that out, but so far, no, no leads. So <laughs> if you come up with any connections, uh, let me know. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Rob, what, what we call, you talked about costs in general, the elements of cost, but uh, what about cost per mile of some of these systems? Uh, and maglev, I, I've heard figures on high-speed rail. I've not, not heard figures on maglev. Um, have you looked into the actual dollar cost very much? Done much uh, of operation or construction? Both. 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 And, and cost justified. Yeah, I, I've looked into some of it. I don't have it all off the top of my head, but I'll say on that, the thing about the maglev, I don't think it has that attractive benefit of conventional rail that I talked about with the concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it doesn't require as much salt and plowing, which is a good thing. I don't know if it requires any salt or plowing at all, for that matter. Um, so it, it, it should be longer lived, uh, the, the maglev, even though it's a it's, you know, solid slab of concrete. But it doesn't have the nice benefits, I think, of conventional rail, where where most of that concrete will live a long, long time and not have to be replaced every 30, 40, 50 years. So, um, and then for operations, it's actually cheaper. It it costs about the same as conventional rail when it runs at its top speed. You know, so if you run it at 300 miles per hour, it costs about as much to operate as a train running at 220 miles per hour conventional. And those are both very favorable, efficient energy uh, and cost. Uh, uses, but it, you can also run it at 220, or you can run it at 100, or like this national park idea. I thought you might run it at 50, you know, and have an open air car or, even, or something, and um, and it would uh, it would you know save a lot of a tremendous amount of money to <laughs> what run about it. The cost per mile the cost of building it. Well, again, that's why I think you have to separate out. Part of it's that know-how. Part of it's the precision, the labor involved in precision laying that concrete just right. That cost, I don't think we should. Be as concerned about as the cost of actually building using that concrete, those environmental costs uh, that we incur. Um, so if it puts people to work to build it, and it takes a long time, and it takes them a lot of time to precision do it, then I think that's something we should look forward to. <laughs> so, well, I, I, I agree, but it, you know, and we can recover, and then we can recover. Like I said, if, if okay. with the highway system, those two cents per mile that we're paying, yeah. if that were three cents, people might complain, but really, it, it, they would be better for them. You know, like if we could build it better and it's three cents out of their 50 cents, you know, that they, they should, I think, well, again, it's a thing where we're trying to save costs here and there, we're trying to save a penny, and we're making people pay 10 cents more somewhere else. And But you don't have any figures on cost per mile, or if you have uh, where to get The one in China was, uh, I think it was uh, something like 40 or 50 million per mile, so it's something not out of line with urban highway systems, okay. but but it's, it's at the high, it's certainly at the high end. Yeah. Uh, you talked about uh, the levitation being a magnetic deal. Uh, everybody wow. knows that uh, magnetism works best the closer that it is. Uh, what about ice and snow? Wouldn't that uh, interfere with the thing operating? Uh, my understanding is that they've tested it. You know, it, the test track that Germany was in Germany, and it was you know in a temperate zone. So they've tested it through a lot of that. And I think the key is to keep keep uh, 
short headways to keep the trains going at a fairly frequent uh, pace, you know, so you, you know, which is all good for all of us, so you would keep it going. But I, my focus is more on the conventional rail. I mean, I think, I think we should, in the United States, we, there was a plan to build a trans-rapid line, and I think we should have went ahead with it, and we should still go ahead with it and, and get some testing going on that. Yeah. Okay, you know, you're, you're going to have all this money spent on, on this new high-speed rail system. Why not just take that money and put a network of buses in with good, strong bus stations everywhere and use the existing infrastructure? But, but make the buses free. Well, I, I, I'm not trying to make this free. I'm trying to make it... Uh, I like when people pay the cost that... that I, I like it when people have to pay the cost that it incurs. You know, that doesn't mean we can't have breaks for, for the indigent and things like that. And I think that's a good thing. In fact, the, the economics of natural monopoly make that really a benefit to everybody. Um, I didn't really talk about that, but when you, when you have a natural monopoly, there's a huge difference between the marginal cost and the average cost. And any time somebody pays above the marginal cost, which can be almost zero sometimes, you know, you, you think about if I ride my bicycle down the street, the, the marginal cost of that is zero. It doesn't cost really anybody to have me bicycling down the street. Um, and so if I pay the marginal cost, you know, if I was paid 10 cents a ride, um, it, would, it would bring down the cost for everybody else of maintaining that. So, so there's some tremendous benefits there, but I, I'm, so I'm not trying to make it so people don't have to pay anything. I just want them, us to pay our, so the social costs of, of what we're incurring. And I don't see a way with highways to have the, the benefits of that, the railway environmentally in the long term. I'm talking like 100 years down the road where we have to keep replacing this concrete over and over again. Um, and we're going to do damage, I think. Uh, a couple of things. <clears throat> First, um, the railways are going to um, continue a slab concrete uh, 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 tracks uh, on a, um, to, to minimize the maintenance cost that, uh, that uh, develops with the de degradation of the surface and line of ballasted track. Even, even with the heavy uh, concrete cross ties and uh, rails that they're using okay. nowadays, uh, uh, <coughs> the modulus of the elasticity of the track for, for a mainline railroad now is up around 5,000 um, psi. Uh, it's, uh, it's much higher than in, in the old days when you basically ran on the dirt. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that new, you know, construction technique. Uh, I'd have to look at it some more in detail, but it might it might counteract some of the benefits I'm saying with conventional rail and make make, trans, make the trans rapid maglev more attractive. I'm, I'm not sure, um, but it's it's interesting. I'll look into that. Yeah. Well, when you talk about the, the trans, what's your question? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a question. It what was. about what about the, <laughs> the change to uh, continuous yeah. concrete? I got the question. Okay. okay. So, anybody else? Let's. Yeah. Okay, well, we're just getting started, Jimmy. Hold on, Charlie. <laughs> Why not? All right, in the back. I know. It What's seems like we are behind on railroad connectivity, just like on fiber optic connectivity around the world. But what I'm interested in, can you make a comment on your plans in constructing this railroad with the plan that we got stuck with 294 at Tri-State? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, can you compare a plant? You know, we are supposed to... Uh, like as a tollway, you mean it? Yeah, right. We, oh. we paid it off, and we're still paying for it. We'll get stuck with similar things. I see, I see. Plan. Well, I, I think, like I said, I think we should finance this more, more through debt, and, I, and that's one of the benefits even. Um, part of our economic problem is a finance problem. We, we have people saving too much, and not, that saving is not finding a productive investment. And so that's why people argue for this Keynesian model of the government coming in and, and spending. And Keynes was like, well, even if you just dig holes and fill them up, you're better off. But I don't subscribe to that. But I do think we need to find productive investment. And so an interstate railway system and otherwise improving our infrastructure does that. So, um, so we should go ahead and finance it with debt so that we, that it's kind of good debt. You know, like the doctors make the distinction between bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. I think we need to make the same distinction between good debt and bad debt. There's debt that we incur for long-term uh, durables 
And if that debt is paid off before the durable dies, you know, before it reaches the end of its useful life, well, that's, that's good debt. You know, that's the way debt is supposed to be used. Um, and so we should do that. As far as tollways go, I'm actually against tollways. I'd like to see us eliminate every tollway in the country for the most part. But I do think that we need to change the way we're pricing our highways. And I think the railway system points some advantages, some ways of doing that. Right now we pay through that gas tax, but that doesn't, with new technology, with electric vehicles, if you plug your car in at home, you don't pay the gas tax. So you're getting the highway for free. And if you, and if everybody did that, that becomes a problem, you know. Um, and people are brewing their own diesel at home, you know, so you, if you do that, you don't pay the gas tax. So this is great to encourage these technologies now, but, you know, in the long run, we have to figure out a way to pay for the highway. So it's a kind of a continuous uh, tollway, in a sense, where your car just basically reports, this is how much I've traveled on the road, and you get a bill for it, you know, it's kind of what I, what I imagine, which is kind of how I see the interstate railway system would pay for itself, too. The rail, the locomotive would report, here's what I'm hauling, here's how much I've hauled it, and you'd get a bill, you know, or you'd be charged off your credit card or something. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, Rob, I'm, when you electrify even the railroads in the past, I believe they generated their own power. Where are you going to find enough electricity for, uh, what do you got, six tracks or four tracks uh, across the United States? Do you want everyone in the United States, like, what, to turn off all their electricity? <laughs> For your railroad? Well, <laughs> there's another example of where we need to look at as, as sort of the totality. So we have to create energy in order to consume energy. A lot of it. And right yeah. now we're con we're still creating that energy in the locomotive locally. You know, uh, right right there on the diesel generator. And uh, many people I didn't know this till a few years ago, but. Most locomotives in the United States are, are hybrid electric. They don't. They actually run off electricity right now, and the diesel is just generating the electricity for them. So it, some of the stuff could be retrofitted quite easily to uh, to use an overhead catenary. Um, and so the the question is, how we generate electricity? Right now, you won't find a power generator, a power company in this country that that looks for diesel or gas gasoline because they're the most expensive fuels to use. So the reason the oil company wants to keep the rails unelectrified is because it's a captive audience, you know, for their for their commodity. So that's why they had to put an end. I mean, the the, the railways in the 20s had ambitions to electrify the entire thing, you know. And so as part of this, you know, buy up the the, the railway operators, they were gonna they were gonna electrify most of the country, and the uh, and just as you saw the the. The oil companies and the, changed the law to stop the, the power generators from running streetcar lines. You know, they were basically yeah. they were lobbying to change the laws in order to get these things dependent upon oil and upon petroleum products. They did the same thing with the with the long distance, you know, inner city trains too. So they, they moved them from coal to, to oil and also shut off that electric option at the same time. So yeah. Oh, get this guy. Well, first of all, you didn't Lowry. really answer. First of all, you didn't really answer Charlie's question. Where do you plan to get the electricity from for this? <laughs> and, and, two, <laughs> and two, it is my understanding that actually it was probably the Depression more than anything else that finished off the plans to electrify the nation's railroads. Well. <laughs> We can disagree about that history. I mean, just to answer the second part of your question, I, I think the Depression was an aid to the oil industry in, in, in their project. You know, I, I kind of get horrified that, you know, while Americans in the 40s were being asked to tighten their belt and for the war effort and keep, you know, keep from consuming things, that was the height of the oil industry going around buying up streetcar lines and shutting them down and replacing them with buses and tires, you know. But, you know, buses on rubber tired and running with diesel or gasoline. So, I mean, it was kind of an attack upon the American people, I think, including the Great Depression. And that's how, kind of how I see it. And I, as far as the energy goes, where does the, I'm saying we're already generating this much energy. We're regenerating with highly inefficient diesel and gasoline. You know, it's like 
why, you're, why aren't you putting a diesel generator in your basement and telling ComEd to take a hike? Because you can't possibly provide the electricity in your house with a diesel generator for the convenience and the price that ComEd can provide it with other means, including natural gas or, or wind and solar and as we expand those. So I think, I think part of the wind and solar revolution will be to produce more energy centrally or in our homes and bring that energy to rails, which then, when we're, when we're switching to shorter trips on more efficient vehicles, on trains, more efficient vehicles, shorter trips and fewer trips, which is what I think rails will do for us, we're talking about generating less energy than the path we're on today, which, was, which is kind of an out of control, unsustainable energy generation path. So in the long term, we're going to be generating less energy than we will uh, if we stay on this path. Try. Yeah, and, and you, you've got a monorail system with your megawatt and all this, but, and then you have low speed, and I don't know what's doing that, but in every railroad, you have something called a junction. And you're going to have six tracks all over the place in the United States. What's going to happen? Are these going to somehow fly over one another? Yeah, it would be. It would be if you have, you, you're going to have like north, south, east, west. Well, you, you think of you're you going to have a lot of track coming together. Okay, th go back to the interstate. Track. Yeah, go back to the interstate highway system example. If I were telling you we were going to have highways that are going very fast and efficiently, and you would say, well, what about the intersections? And I'm telling you, there won't be any. So there won't be any junctions. There'll be flyovers. And, and again, the standards need to be higher. In fact, that's another one of the interesting li lingering standards that didn't go up. Even though most of the standards were in place when Eisenhower kick-started our highway system in 1956, it wasn't until 1965 where they finally said, let's not have any more great railroad crossings on the interstate. You know, I mean, I, I was born in 1965, so I, I'm kind of like horrified the idea that anybody thought we were going to have great railroad crossings across our interstates. But that was a late, a late upgrade to the standards. And so what I'm saying is, let's go ahead and realize we need high standards from the beginning. We may end up upgrading them still, but let's we won't have any uh, at grade crossings, no junctions. Uh, or of any kind, they'll all be flyovers between the interstate railway systems. The, the, the heavy freight, I'm not saying we're going to change the heavy freight as much. Um, it's going to be a lot like it is today, except it will use the same railway traffic control system where you, you just simply schedule time. I need to travel from point A to point B. When can I go? And they'll, the rail traffic controller will tell you, okay, go now. And go at this speed. And you know, if you can't maintain that speed, let me know. You know that kind of thing. Thank you, Anybody Tim. else? Thank you, sweetheart. Question? Can I go one more? Oh, All right. Uh, look, one more for Charlie, and then we go to rebuttals. Okay. In the entire United States, I think there are only two places that get four track main lines. Uh, right here, a little bit up on the west side by Aurora and Pennsylvania Central. And you want four track across the entire United States or six track? Well, the, the four track is for the high speed rail segment, the, the express and the, and the local. Those would more often be alongside the existing interstate highway system. So we'd be building an additional right of way, basically doubling the right of way alongside our interstate highway system like that. And that's a lot of rail. <clears throat> It's a lot of railroad. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned. I didn't mention the co like the original costs. Tim mentioned in the introduction. I, I mean, I don't want to dialogue with you, but railroads have you know the thing, and they cut unnecessary track out and cut it in half. It doesn't sound like they lost track, but they're using less track more efficiently. And you want to come back more than double, quadruple. Well, again, it's for what purpose? I mean, when you have, when you privatize these governmental powers, they use them for their own whims. And so, like, your own whim might mean I have too many rails, I have too many tracks. 
But if you look at it for a public purpose, like what is the public need to get between point A and point B? What do we need to get between all of these cities quickly and efficiently and safely? Um, you know, and I, I, I could have talked about the costs a little more. I mean, the, the interstate highway system was $450 billion and it was well invested. As I said, nobody would regret it, I don't think. Um, so I'm saying let's start off $450 billion ballpark. I'm talking about spending $450 billion on constructing rails, intercity, interurban, interstate railway system between every you know, major metropolitan area in the country. And so with that kind of money, and then paid for through the same usage fees, you know, through usage fees. So it's not paid for through income tax dollars, it's paid through, through usage fees, and it will have a profit which goes into the public treasury and reduces our taxes at the same time. And all of that is possible because it is a, a natural monopoly and there's a tremendous power to it. Um, and it has a tremendous benefit alongside it. Haven't there been some other proposals for a national uh, high-speed rail passenger service in, in the past? And how, uh, how does your plan differ from those? Well, right now those are pretty much guided again by the privatized railways. And they are basically saying, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea if you took money from the public treasury and put it into our railway? And I mean, I feel the same way about my house. Wouldn't it be nice if you just took money from the public treasury and upgraded my house? But um, I think the problem with those is they're completely guided by the interests of these privileged private monopolists. And instead, I'm proposing a plan that would think about what is it the public needs for transportation in the long run and, and how would we best provide that. Well, I, well, if I may rebut you at this point, uh, most of those plans were not prepared by the private railroads. Uh, the USRA, for one, um, and, and the U.S. DOT have prepared similar uh, plans in the past, and these are not those of the... Right, but I'm, I'm talking about, the, right now we have, we have a corrupt system that serves these monopolists. So if the U.S. Department of Transportation is making up the plans, it's making up the plans to serve their clients, which are the private monopolized railways. And, you know, I, I find it hard to imagine that taking all this public fund and investing it in a private enterprise wasn't fought up by the private enterprise. I mean, maybe it wasn't. Maybe they're just naturally corrupt. I don't know, but um, I think I think it's a very corrupt thing to do to take public money and just put it put it into those private enterprises like that. So uh, I'd be very surprised if they weren't behind it in some way. They're not going to make a commercial about it. Like you know, they they love to make commercials about how nice how great the railways are or the, these monopolists, but. They're not going to make one that says, and we, uh, we came up with the idea of taking your tax dollars and putting it into our, our enterprise. Three, three These guys are patiently waiting. All right. All right. We'll go, we'll go uh, seven, up to six minutes on the rebuttals. So uh, please go ahead and get started. You guys know the procedures. You know what to do. And let's, let's go at it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's um, roll. Some dis uh, discreet uh, um, comments. First of all, I wanted to mention the Illinois Central Railroad. It had a wonderful set of uh, dual tracks running from Chicago uh, to uh, St. Louis. Uh, in order to finance part of its debt and to make money available for bonuses for its executives, they sold one complete set of tracks. So now it's a single set of tracks running from Chicago to St. Louis. Marvelous idea. That was before, just before, they sold the railroad to the Canadian National. Marvelous idea. Um, there was an interurban electric uh, train, yeah. trains, plural, that ran throughout the east and all the way to Chicago yeah, from yeah, the yeah. east. And it would make stops in all of the major cities in the states between them, going down into Tennessee uh, and then going uh, eastward from there to Washington. It worked very well. It was very inexpensive. It was all electrified. Uh, and it was pushed out of business uh, in the 1920s. Um, the US Department of Transportation conducted an experiment and a demonstration. It was a marvelous thing. They had a concept of building a, a, a roadway, a, a highway for automobiles and trucks uh, that would not 
require the, the continual uh, maintenance of the highways. Uh, the construction was not much different than it is now. The way they did it, they would put a bed of coarse gravel, uh, another layer of finer gravel on top of that, and then they would put six inches of polyethylene foam. Polyethylene foam. It, it, it gives and it's very, it's quite rigid, uh, and yet it allows it. Then they would put concrete on top of that. The, the polyethylene foam would permit the concrete to stretch, to bend, very little, but it would avoid the cracking. Now it cracks because it, the concrete is right on top of the uh, second layer of gravel. It doesn't give, it doesn't stretch. They're doing that on some new highways now. This was done in 1984. They built 16 miles of track, of roadway, in 16 different parts of the country, one mile stretches. And uh, they determined, after a statistical analysis, uh, that the half-life of this type of railroad was 100 years. Compared to the present concrete uh, process, uh, which has a, a half-life of 13 and a half years. So you can see the, the benefits of uh, something like that. And that's applicable, of course, to the uh, rail beds uh, for high-speed electric styrofoam. trains and so forth. It's styrofoam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the real goal of the Eisenhower um, effort to build the interstate highway uh, was not so much to, to, to promote uh, uh, transportation or interstate commerce, anything like that. The concept, although it, er, it was uh, uh, initially done in the 1940, late 40s, um, Eisenhower, when he came to office, had seen the effects of World War II on the European community. And he also saw the revolts of the uh, working people in those European countries. And he was concerned that that might apply in the United States. So his interstate highway system was designed to bring the military from one part of the country to another part of the country very quickly and without having to worry about defacing signs or missing signs. They were all the, all the exits were numbered in each state, so you go from one at the south end, and it would continue up until the, uh, uh, the last exit before the state ended and then start over again. So the uh, navigators for the military would simply count off the number of exits as they went along, and they would know exactly where they were going. Uh, so the, the, the purpose of the uh, interstate highway system that we enjoy now was really to control us through the use of military. Okay. What else is new? We are we are fucked and we will be fucked and we continue to be fucked. But if you are putting all that plastic shit under the bed, then we will have billions of tons of plastic shit covering the earth. Uh, so keep keep it going. Um, I, I have to thank uh, the speaker for a very, uh, I think, very thoughtful and profound explanation of what we are confronting. Um, I got to tell you that as we are in a system that was established by the first Europeans coming to the America to exploit the resources and the people, then this is the same system that started a long time ago. And so whatever we're doing or whatever uh, we try to do to help ourselves to live a better life uh, end up being another way to suck our blood and our energies and everything else. I wonder what are we going to do when the resources of our Earth are exhausted and we are coming to the point that a lot of the things that are indispensable to maintain this system of industrialization are, are becoming more and more uh, limited. Uh, 
uh, how many rails, how many roads, how many automobiles, how many trips we have to do back and forth to live a comfortable life. I think that we are basing all this on the uh, ideology that there is no limit to, uh, to limit to what we may desire. Um, when we're talking about production of electricity, uh, you know, there are, there are limits because of the water supplies, the, work, the, the earth is getting warmer, the rivers are running drier, and you cannot run any plant, whether a thermal plant by burning coal or gas, or a, a nuclear power plant without water. So um, it, is, it is important that we see the limits of this, of this planet. Um, I, I, I don't want to see more development. I would like to see a change in the attitude that we don't need that much to, to continue prospering and put, put that more money in education, in, in, in social services. And uh, when you use uh, money for social services, you can employ a lot of people taking care of older people or education or, or whatnot. So this is my, my point. Good evening. Uh, Tom Jefferson uh, established a uh, tax on liquor, whiskey, and uh, it created a rebellion that almost resulted in a revolution. Uh, we taxed the daylights out of liquor until in 1913 they established an income tax. And then of course in 1920 they introduced prohibition because they didn't need to tax liquor anymore. They could now take it directly out of the people's hides. And so uh, uh, while they thought liquor was no longer needed for that and that they attempted to do away with liquor altogether, but that uh, was found not to work. Uh, the, um, it seems to me that everything government does, they either screw up or they do con completely wastefully. Uh, the reason I brought that up about the um, liquor and the whiskey and all that is that the, um, uh, the it seems to me that the government, uh, well, let me say this, that, that if you had a 20-year-old a, a son who had one accident after another with his car and then uh, came to you and said, gosh, Dad, uh, if you would come up with $90,000, uh, I can get a limo and I can go out and I can make a lot of money with that, and I promise I'll be a good driver, et cetera, et cetera. The, the fact is, you would say, son, you just don't have a very good track record. And the same thing applies to the government. The government took over a railroad quite a few years ago, and they called it Amtrak. And Amtrak has lost money every year, and they have had to go to the to the uh, Congress and the Senate hat, hat in hand and ask for more money because we can't let the Northeast be with, with a whole Northeastern corridor be without a, a railroad. So we have to have Amtrak. And the, the fact is that if they hadn't regulated them into bankruptcy in the first place, the, uh, that, that particular railroad, the Penn Central, uh, would still be operating and yeah. operating profitably. So the, the fact is that I say in view of the government's track record, I don't think we should have a nationalized railroad. And if we ever did, 
it should be in the hands of private industry because private industry gets the job right. done and they do it according to the dictates of the customer, the real dictatorship of the proletariat, the customer whose dollars make it go. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Rob, enjoyed your presentation tonight. I think that you are somewhat of an unrecognized visionary in a lot of different ways. I'm not to say I agree with everything you say or all of your ideas, but with your views on, on how to use the commons and and uh, your, your one-time uh, net worth tax and some of the other things you've come up with. Some of the other things you've come up with, I think, are, 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 are truly good ideas, which in our current political environment may never see the light of day, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, we should have more folks like you coming up with these ideas, and sooner or later some of them might uh, catch on. Um, as far as a, a, a high-speed rail system, a nationwide system, or at least parts of it, I think it's a fantastic idea, but the cost uh, creates, uh, there are a lot of problems with the cost. You said 40 to 50 million dollars a mile. I've heard costs as low as 2 million dollars a mile and up to 80 million dollars a mile. So I think it amounts to the fact that nobody really knows. But at your cost, 40 million dollars a mile, that uh, what's that? That was maglev. Oh, that's maglev. Okay, well that's okay. That would be 32 billion dollars and if it would be less, uh, the other way that would be better, but it would still amount to expensive tickets uh, back and forth to New York, unfortunately. More so than some of the air tickets we pay for. Although air tickets, it's hard to know. When you get one of those $99 fares, they're really subsidized by the people that are paying $1,000 for the same trip. So it's, it's hard to analyze the cost purely. But uh, I'd love to see it. I'd love to be able to get on a train at Union Station and be in Manhattan four hours later. That'd be great. But uh, I'm not sure how, how you know whether that's really going to come to be here. Uh, I suspect that high-speed rail is more useful over short and medium distances. Uh, if you look at all the trains that are successful, most of them are a few hundred miles. There, there aren't too many that are 2,000 miles. I don't know that will ever be cost-effective to build a high-speed rail, let's say, from Chicago to Los Angeles because it would, it would not successfully compete with air. It would take too long, even at high speeds, and, and the cost would be huge. Whereas going up and down the East Coast or some shorter runs, I'd like to see one from Chicago to New York because there's a lot of, sh of short routes on the way between those other cities as well. Uh, I think that might work, the, the short and medium distances. And if you look at the European trains and the Japanese trains, uh, most of them are fairly short distances. Even in China, the most successful runs. Uh, there's a run from, uh, uh, from I believe, Beijing to uh, Tintian, I believe is the name of the port city, Hong about Kong. 200 miles. Hong Kong. <clears throat> no, no, not Hong Kong. They're, it's shorter. It's a 200 mile run. They run the train every 15 minutes. Thousand passengers per train. And they're full most of the time. If you go down without a reservation, you'll probably have to wait for the next train or the next train. Yeah. So, so we're talking, uh, we're talking 20, 30,000 passengers, 40,000 passengers a day. When you're doing that on a 200-mile line, it, it, it pays for itself. But the longer lines, even in China, there are people who are saying they've overspent on some of the, some of the longer lines. Um, the one of the issues here we're talking about concrete. Uh, Tires on concrete versus rail versus maglev. Uh, the basic consideration uh, seems to be the equation is, is the lower operating costs, which are lower for rail than for, for, for rubber tire, and, and uh, the lowest of all is maglev. But the initial construction costs are higher in each case. And you need uh, a, a lot of passengers to justify that initial cost. That's one of the reasons 
they're starting to, to look at this BRT, bus rapid transit here in Chicago and other places because the initial cost is much lower. The roads are already there basically. You have to build a few stations, a few, few control lights and this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, it's much less than building a rail system, either underground or overground or whatever. And uh, so, the, so the uh, bus rapid transit is for that reason becoming popular because governments don't have any money. They want to spend the billions of dollars necessary to build the systems, even if they would pay for themselves in 50 or 100 years. They don't want to spend the money now uh, because they don't have it. Uh, one of the ways that we can move people to uh, rapid transit and to trains is to increase the cost of automobiles to a more, re uh, we, we, the price of gas is subsidized in many ways, uh, not the least of with, which is defense expenses. Uh, in my opinion, we should bring gas taxes to the level they are in Europe, at least. That would, re that would reduce people's driving. Uh, and also, we should pay more for plate fees. People complain about the fact that they pay $100, $200 for their plates each year. I think that the, the fees for that should be many times that, and it should be based on when you drive your car and where you drive your car. If you're willing to just drive your car in your neighborhood and, and primarily in, uh, in uh, uh, off hours, you should pay very little for your plates. But if you want to drive your car on the expressways into downtown Chicago in rush hour, you should pay through the nose, in my opinion. And this would reduce, and, and that's a form of congestion pricing. I think we should look at that. There's several cities, London, Stockholm, and I think some others that, that use congestion pricing. It's a very useful thing. Uh, people pay for what they use, in other words. You pay when you want, if you want to drive in the prime areas, at the prime hours, then, then you pay for it. Uh, and regarding what Dave said about the fact that, that Amtrak is losing money, so is the CTA, so are most rapid transit systems in the entire world. I'm told there's only one in the entire world that makes money, and that's Hong Kong. Uh, but this is one of the things that we do in government. It's part, part of the commons. That we have transit available to people, both for the benefit of the people and for the benefit of the community as a whole, and that it takes takes cars off the road and it allows people to get from place to place more efficiently. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your next talk, Rob. One of the things that I like about taking public transit is that entertainment we get sometimes when we're captive audiences in the stations. Come on up, Billy Ann, and let's give us an example of some of that in-station entertainment. Oh, come on. Come on. Bullshit. Come on. I try to dedicate this song. It's in Russian language, but tomorrow Mother Day, and I would like to dedicate this beautiful song to my mother, Dr. Irene. Even we. I will give a little bit of translation, so idea what I will try to say. So um, even we are growing up, we always need our mom to talk to us, no matter what. Because our mother is very special, very important to us. So this song, a cappella, it's not, uh, I don't have piano right now, maybe later, so now, okay. Go ahead. Давно ли песни ты мне пела, над колыбелью наклонялась? Но время птицей пролетело, И в детство нить оборвалась. Поговори со мною, мама, О чем-нибудь поговори. До звездной полночи, до самой, Мне снова детство подари. Довольна я своей судьбою, Того, что пройдено, не жаль. 
Но как мне хочется порою Вернуть безоблачную да. Поговори со мной, мама, О чем-нибудь поговори. До самой полночи, до самой, Мне снова детство подари. Минуты сказочные эти Навек оставлю в сердце я. Довольно всех наград на свете Улыбка нежная твоя. Поговори со мною, маму, О чем-нибудь поговори. До звездной полночи, до самой Мне снова детство подари. You do realize that in Paris they audition for those slots to entertain commuters at the stations. Now, since I've used up my time already, in something like this. Let's get on to our next speaker. First of all, first of all, Joe was right when he talked about President Eisenhower and national defense. People don't forget, people forget that as I recall that 1956 act was called the National Defense Interstate Highway Act. Uh, secondly, Amtrak is very badly needed as an alternative to the airlines, uh, which have become overcrowded and have forgotten how to provide quality service. No, no, we still need Amtrak. And as Ernie pointed out, transit services nowhere except in Hong Kong earn a profit. That's not, it is not, and should not be their purpose. It should be to provide the best service possible. And as for Penn Central being allowed, uh, to, uh, being allowed to run itself. Now, granted, I'm not unsympathetic to the idea that the railroads in general overly regulated. And that's what did them in. And also that they, when the government was busy funding highways and air travel, Something should have been done for the railroads as well. But anybody who has read Dawn and Benzin's book, Wreck of the Penn Central, knows that Penn Central was run by crooks. And it was hardly an honestly run business. The leaders of that business were busy fighting among themselves. There was a lot of insider dealing going on. And it's no wonder why the company went belly up. It should never have been brought into being in the first place. And one of the excuses that they used to justify the merger of the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central was again to promote national defense. You used to see it in their ads in their time in the Pennsylvania Railroad timetables all the time. Buses, despite what Tim may have thought, are not a good alternative to railroads, at least not the system that he proposed. Buses pollute and are not as energy efficient as railroads as trains would be. Um, it was not Thomas Jefferson who proposed the tax that ignited the Whiskey Rebellion. That was in 1793, and the president was George Washington. Um, we have had public-private partnerships in the past. Uh, one of them built the Transcontinental Railroad. That was the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. Though, I, again, the que I question the honesty on both the government and uh, private sides of the fence in a lot of what went on with that. And finally, well, I am very sympathetic to Rob's proposal. And you gave a good program. You did uh, say, well, we'll just get to us. Um, getting that such a proposal from Congress, 
even past the Democrats, never mind the Republicans, uh, it's going to have a lot of people screaming. And that's not quite going to be so easy as all that. Thank you. Yeah, that is good. That's okay. Oh, I see. I'm Harvey Taylor. A couple of you know me. Uh, this is only my second time in one of these things. Um, where do I start? Uh, first of all, let's address the core issue. Uh, to have a national system, you need uh, a threshold level of use across the country that's going to allow the average person to buy into it as some kind of uh, uh, political necessity. With well, the interstate highway, uh, if you had an interstate highway near you, you could say, oh yeah, I can, you know, drive from my farm a few miles to, the, to, a, to a convenient interchange and, you know, take the road uh, 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 maybe 20 miles into a larger city and, uh, you know, whether you're doing a shopping trip or whether you're uh, going for some feed or something or, you know, whatever the case may be in a rural area or if you're in the city, you're, uh, you're visiting uh, a, a friend across the, across the region. Um, you have these short trips. You also have people making longer trips. Uh, and all of these trips add up a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit across the whole thing. These things add up and everybody uses it. We also have a very low threshold of competency for driving. So everybody should be able to drive. Some people shouldn't be on a road, but we still want them to drive anyway, because that way they will support the system politically. I don't think we can, uh, the way things are set up now, I don't think we have a means of uh, doing that. And what is worse, Amtrak is, uh, well, Congress actually, I guess, and Amtrak are proposing to have the states fully support local services that aren't on the regional, uh, there, there are less than 750 miles that are not on the transcontinental system to be funded by individual states. That means the individual states have to get together and decide that they're going to do this thing together. More or less taking over the role that's been usurped, that's been um, um, uh, lost or, or given away by, by the National uh, Rail Passenger Corporation, Amtrak. Uh, the reason Amtrak is doing this is because they're trying to look good and keeping their budget down and or a lower so they look happier with the so it's a, uh, so it looks like they're kind of like going out of business like the Republicans want them to do. Uh, so of course the budget is going down and they have the, the strategy of, of uh, reducing those costs. Well, there's no way in heck that Obama's goal of having 80% of the country population connected by rail is ever going to happen when you have uh, individual states trying to get together uh, to, to um, piece together a national network. It just ain't going to happen, folks. You see what's, you, you see what's happening in Ohio and, and Indiana. They have totally uh, cut off any possibility of this New York Chicago service. Uh, furthermore, you've got the railroads that have, that have rationalized their system to the point where they don't have any track capacity with all their freight trains to, to uh, put on a passenger train that is operating any more than about 40 or 50 miles an hour with their slower freight trains are doing uh, to, uh, to go from point A to point B because it just isn't the, the window to have a fast train running in, on those tracks. Um, so you, you, you need uh, more of a national system, uh, and I think the only way to do it uh, rationally without spending four, $450 billion is try to build it up from the existing system first where you can. If it means adding a third track in some places to, to say like the Norfolk Southern Maine, um, that would be a heck of a lot cheaper than um, 
and especially where some of the line was laid out for four tracks anyway, uh, to, to restore a third track uh, is going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than trying to build a whole new high-speed line off, right off the top. If you, if you could get um, like hourly service or uh, every two-hour service between, say, like Chicago, uh, Toledo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh with branches, uh, Cleveland and branches to uh, Pittsburgh and Buffalo from, from the Chicago end, uh, uh, and it, at, uh, at just conventional speeds, uh, you'd have a service and be able to reach these people. The system would be viable to another, uh, what, maybe 10% uh, of the uh, country's population to start with. Uh, I don't think the train in the middle of the night to Cleveland or Pittsburgh is really uh, a, a relevant um, uh, service for most travelers. Uh, and if it's not relevant to them, it's not politically relevant, and there's no reason why they should ask, the, uh, ask their, uh, their uh, elected officials to, uh, to support it. So you, you've got these, you've got these uh, 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 relationships that need to be rethought to get any kind of a national system going. Um, long distance trains, there's been a big debate about that. I'm not, I don't really want to get into that now. Uh, it's kind of a special niche market uh, at best. Uh, they do a lot of good things. Uh, obviously, they can't cover the whole country. It's uh, it's almost like the interstate system. Uh, interstate, uh, what is it, 94 that goes across uh, Montana? You know, I mean, it's the same problem with, with, with the interstate, Interstate 94. You know, it's relevant to a few people in Montana, but not everybody. Um, uh, Illinois has, um, getting back to the relevance issue, there's over 60% of the population of Illinois, the county populations, is, has an Amtrak station in it. Wisconsin, only about 30%. So it's easy to understand, in the terms of relevance to the voter, why Wisconsin was able to kill their passenger service to Madison. The proposed one. They didn't have the, they didn't have that threshold political thing. Illinois was fortunate because the, the base, because the routes coming out of Chicago formed a basis, a basic network that touched enough population that the service could be relevant. We have to do this for the whole for the whole country. Am my six minutes up yet? The hook will come out. No, um, we're, 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 uh, we're watching. Don't worry. Um, I said before, uh, uh, there's technical issues involved with the uh, um, with concrete, uh, what they call uh, a slab track, uh, in terms of maintenance these days. Uh, uh, highway maintenance. Uh, I worked in the uh, Regional Planning Agency in Northwest Indiana, and at that point, um, the uh, the highway maintenance cost per year was twice as was costing twice as much as what it cost to build the darn interstates across Indiana in the first place. Another thing about the interstate system, um, you may be interested to note that all the tollways around Chicago are very heavily used. And we have tollways here because of that. The state could take the allocation for the interstate system and direct that for interstate highways uh, with a network across downstate Illinois. Because upstate, in, around Chicago, it was all toll roads. Uh, they, so they didn't have to spend the money up here, they could spend it all downstate. So that was a political thing that was going on there. And the toll roads helped them do that. Uh, is it equitable? I don't think so. But that's the way, but that's the way it was. The roads, um, the interstate highways up here are ex extremely expensive. We, uh, thank God we have Metro. They, they say that if Metro went belly up, they just stopped running the trains. Uh, we need 26 more lanes of highway in, uh, for the metropolitan area to get, get to downtown Chicago. 
rather than using the existing asset that we have. One train can carry 1,500 passengers. That's about the uh, uh, the Class C uh, level use uh, lane volume on, on, uh, on a highway. So one train an hour takes care of the same volume of cars in an hour on a lane of the highway. Um, if you can, but the thing is, when you're talking about a, a, a national network, are you going to have 500 to 1,000 passengers an hour that you can get together to ride on a train that may make, that may make a, a, an occasional stop every 30 miles or so? That means you're not going to have the people that are using that thing that are only going 15 miles. Uh, you may have the people that are going the, three, the, the 300 between Chicago and St. Louis, but you're going to have the, also have the people in, in the other thing, uh, like between Bloomington and uh, Springfield, but you're not going to have the people going between Piney and, say, like Chenoa. You're not going to be having those small trips or between Chenoa and uh, uh, Bloomington. You're not going to have those small trips to build up that, that build up that volume, build up that relevance. You uh, you have to you have to be able to your economic model for the for a uh, uh, national rail system has to take into consideration how many people you can attract to it to make it a viable proposition. All right, thanks. Thanks. To me, this whole bit about high-speed rail is a moot point. Because personally, I like the motor car. I like its convenience. I like its schedulability. And I like the fact that I can go where I want, when I want, at a reasonable cost. For example, I left my house today at 4.30, and by 5.30 I was in Skokie seeing a friend. At approximately 7 o'clock I left his house and was here within a reasonable amount of time at the College of Complexes, all in the comfort of my Scion XP. Now, if public transit was running, I'd have to leave very early in the morning, catch a metro train, a few buses up to Skokie, and then, of course, some other kind of cab or something from my friend's house down here, not to mention the six or seven hours it's going to take me to get home. Well, maybe not so much there, but I'd still have to take a cab from the metro station or my car from there to home. So for me, if there's a way that you could get the public transit system as convenient as a car, I'd love it. You know, I'd even be willing to pay a premium for that convenience right now. And I think I already do. But for me, nothing is going to beat a private motor coach for transit in and out of the city. I can leave tonight within about 45 minutes, be sitting at my front door at home watching some television, and there ain't no way that public transit is going to do that for me. Thanks a lot. And what price is $10 a gallon? Yeah. Oh, it would still be worth it. It'd still be worth it. Tim, this show is not about transit, it's about bullet trains. <laughs> so, you were you on public your, transit on the yeah, all, all, don't have with to your motor vehicle. vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the reason I'm we're... Words. Okay, let me review. The reason we're building electric bullet trains all over the world, There's except so in the good old, good old USA. <laughs> By the way, it was fun to hear somebody speak uh, unkindly about monopolies here, as well as the government, in one show. Good to hear that. <laughs> and my, my opinion is, if you don't like the government, just don't call the fire department, go to the schools, have your road repaired, don't get it, don't call the ambulance from your town, and yeah, that's an even wash, I think. Okay, here, a review. Why we're building electric bullet trains around the world and not in the USA. Okay, first, electric bullet trains use no freaking oil. Okay, I have a funny suspicion, since air aviation uses 20% of all the wor oil worldwide, that that's the whole reason there's this, this goddamn climate change, if, if it is true. I'm not even saying climate change is true. But aviation uses about 20%. There's no, absolutely, no, 
pollution control and on aviation on jet engines. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So we're, the reason for electric bullet trains, they don't use oil. They don't pollute. They can use sustainable electricity, whatever you want. Wind, fans, solar, nukes, whatever you, whatever the hell you want. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, it's incredible. You hear that right. There hasn't been, like, there's, there was like 20 or 80 people killed on a bullet train in Germany 20 years ago. Otherwise, it's incredible. I mean, unbelievable, the statistics. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people die in car accidents every year. And, and thousands and thousands die in uh, aviation accidents worldwide every year. So it, bullet trains, nobody dies. I, one or two a year, it's incredible. So yeah, so those dead. But yeah, it's not, nothing. It's, so, uh, another reason, well, there's other reasons for it's, it's, it's you know, they're, they're um, comfortable and you, you arrive in the CBD, development of downtowns, reduces congestions for you air, auto car people and aviation people. Um, okay, a couple other points. You know, I was glad to hear about the monopolies. Hold on, I just, I'm almost done. I'm going to wrap this up quick. Uh, because I think, yeah, you know, freight railroads are monopolies. Damn it. 66 per, you know, two-thirds of what they haul is either coal or um, containers, and they're in no freaking hurry. You know, they, so bullet trains are a whole different mode. Trust me on that one. Um... Uh, and in fact, with these monopolies, speaking on a more macro sense, uh, I can see where we should be breaking up more monopolies these days and putting people to work, including freight railroads, including telecom, including whatever else is being monopolized under our nose. There's my political comment. Uh, and by the way, Amtrak, yes, we do need Amtrak. And I'll tell you what, Amtrak is not inner city rail. Am Amtrak is goddamn city country rail. And don't let anybody prove you otherwise because it goes to all the red states and all the little towns from here to Nebraska to, to Wyoming. It's for people in small towns to get to larger towns and the colleges, and the prisons, and wherever else. It's not inner, <laughs> yeah, a lot of prison stuff. So, um, just a couple other quick points. Uh, I'm you know, curious about the Keystone Pipeline. Is that a monopoly? <laughs> and how do you divvy that up? Okay, everybody's gonna put their oil into this pipe, and I'm, I'm gonna be the, Toll keeper for the pipe, but for the oil, and I want to be a part of that monopoly, huh, CP? Yeah. We're run that pipeline. It's a corporate venture. <laughs> really? But a, yeah. a, a bunch of monopolies. No, it's a monopoly. monopoly. Trust. What's that? You know what? A pipeline is a transport mode, by the way, Artie. Yeah, but it's, but it's one mode. The yeah. Railroads, the railroads are hauling ten times more. Shale oil, or not shale oil, uh, more oil Tarzan. Out, out, out of uh, North Dakota than what the uh, XL pipeline will ever carry. Today, already. Yeah, I know. I see a lot of oil tankers coming on yeah. BN and UP and everything. Unfortunately, there was a derailment in Minnesota, and one of the tankers split open. They got 20, they, they lost 20,000 gallons of oil. The pipeline burst in Arkansas, and they lost uh, 10 times that. No. Okay. Okay. Um, what else? Yeah, the gas tax. You know what? Whenever I pay a tax on something like Lincoln Restaurant food, it's always a percentage. And you know, any any kind of crap we buy, Apple computers, it's always a percentage. But no gasoline, it's only that 18 per 18 cents a gallon. What the hell is all that about? I've been noticing that for years. So glad you brought that up. Okay. Uh, what else do I got to chip out here? <laughs> oh, one more thing. Speaking of transport modes, these damn congressmen, I don't care if they're Democrat, well, probably more Republican. All right. Boy, oh boy, we take away their sequester money from their airports that are subsidized in their small bum fuck towns, and all of a sudden they're inconvenienced because they got to fly to Washington 
But you know what? They got to get their sequester money back, don't they? <laughs> Bastards! Oh, they're inconvenienced because we got to take. Eat, they, they, you know, sorry. Don't don't touch our airport no, subsidies for our control towers. A Republican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of Republican congressmen were on that one. All right. Well, that's about it. Break up the monopolies. Put people back to work. We have Thank a, you. Go ahead. We have another speaker here. Yeah. Uh, well, this, uh, that, this young lady here will have desire to. No, no, I, I don't know. Okay. Charlie, are you I don't know anything to say. I don't have anything to Tell them about the trains in Europe. I lived in Europe in three countries. It was me for oh, just about a year each. And in Spain, uh, I remember one time that I was on the train. And this is pro train, okay? Because I was on the train going to a small town and. This lady just opened up this bag, and she had so many, so much food. I mean, it was like incredible, like, like sandwiches and you know, with cheese and egg and you know, vegetables and fruit. And she like gave it to everybody who was there. Like we, if we were in the same row with her, we all got to share in the food. I just couldn't believe it, it was such a cultural experience. I never forget. Um, one other time, I went on a train to another small town, and when I got to the town, you know, I went to this guy's house where his aunt lived, and you know, they had chickens in the backyard, and they were just walking all around, and I was just like, wow, I've never seen that before. And then one time, I was going over the border from Italy to Germany, and it was really kind of scary because um, we were in first class, but the, I don't know how you want to take this because I'm just talking. Uh, when you got to the border, the German soldier, uh, the German authority came on and took everybody out of first class who wasn't supposed to be there. But it was kind of a relief because it was so crowded and it was like crazy. <laughs> so it was like, phew, you know? There was like no laws down in Italy, but up in Germany they, they, they set the laws down. <laughs> and uh, let's see, other train stories. Task Force Manaharan. Uh, <laughs> I think that's it. I don't. Oh, I, I did take from northern Spain down to south, southern Spain, and it was just so. And not recently or anything. So now it's even faster. But even then, it was fast, and it was called Talgo. And I recommend, you know, we uh, visit Spain at least. Bye. Charlie, Charlie, before you get started, I just wanted to say that gentleman's T-shirt gave me the idea. I found Tim's comments to be uh, found that I was un unmoved by Tim's comments. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker again for uh, his, his, his speaking. Uh, in the future, here I'm going to be eclectic as usual again. <laughs> Happy train day, whatever your mode of travel may be. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the terrible government. You know, we had a conversation today at train day. And you know what we were discussing, sir? There was a thing that happened in 1917 where the United States government took over the entire rail network of the United States. And what was it, the National, National Rail... It was the USRA, the United States yeah, you, Railway Administration. Yes, and we were discussing, they actually had standardized the steam engines with six categories or something like that. And the reason they did it is because, um, well, at least that I, the one account that I read, was precipitated by the fact that the box cars were going to the east coast and no one was moving them back west because they were empty and they didn't get uh, remuneration or at least uh, we won't get into returning box cars but 
Nevertheless, the government took over, and the topic of our discussion was, was that it worked so well that it continued after the war. And it was only that the private sector, capitalist, fascist, Wall Street money mongers, started complaining, specifically the Republicans and other conservative elements, that the railroads return, were returned to the private sector. There was no urgency to return it. So in terms of this crazy whiskey stuff, I don't know what whiskey has to do with railroads, other than the fact that a great many railroad personnel are have occasion to be intoxicated. <laughs> Code red, they call it. Uh, but anyhow, no, they, they were. Um, okay, I'm going to jump to another thing. If you want to talk about highways versus roads, I can go to our website there at the, the railroad, and if you can find it in the middle, there's a thing called Reasons for Rails, and it does a comparison of highways. Uh, the cost of one mile of Reasons for Rails. It's in the center of the page on what the... Website? The New York to Chicago. Oh, okay. And I can tell you, like one mile of of railroad track is equal to in cost like 15 or 20 miles of highway, and all kinds of data in that nature. Reasons for rails has been picked up. Six tracks, quite ambitious. You're really building a railroad. I thought New York to Chicago was a big idea there. <laughs> And you're going to electrify it. That's four. That's four. <laughs> oh, whatever. No, uh, that's going to be quite an infrastructure here. Actually, there is a slow way to electrify it. If you put a, a canopy over the entire track system uh, with solar panels, you, you'll get enough power to uh, power your railroad. I was just curious, some other things, like how many trains per day were you going to run? What kind of routes? Uh, were you going to have uh, interstate rail, or were these going to be long distance passenger trains? Was the train going to run from the East Coast to the West Coast? Uh, that's just some of the things. The other thing I, I should tell you about high speed trains, there's, uh, it's not just the infrastructure, but you got your maintenance away. That requires an enormous amount. There's one drawback to high speed rail, like the Japanese systems. They shut down at night entirely, and there are thousands of guys in uniforms who go out there and see to it that that track is maintained. So your network is going to require quite a quite a maintenance system here. Should we do this? Definitely. Uh, just the other day, I caught a documentary that 70 percent of the goods in the United States are transported by semi-trailer truck. That's absurd. That's that's such a, that's, that's just deranged. That's an illness. That's, that's not even policy. That's just goofy uh, to be using fossil fuels to transport uh, things of that nature. Uh, you already talked about that route. Actually, there's another link in there. I'd have to think about it. But that route, I think he was talking about, they just sold their one millionth passenger ticket. Uh, rail does in fact work, uh, and it's certainly much preferable to automobiles. Uh, Bernie, Ernie again, BRT is one of the most nonsensical things in transportation I've ever seen. I first saw one in Las Vegas, I photographed it. They take buses and they make them like streamlined like they did in the 30s. And they, I've seen ones, they make them look like rocket ships. <laughs> and, and this is supposed to trick the passenger or something. People don't like buses. Only in Vegas. They don't like buses. Put in light rail. It's not that more expensive than what you're supposed to do. This is, this is an absurdity. As a matter of fact, the person who's advancing in Chicago, I've had some disputes with this Metropolitan Planning Council is advocating this, and the guy who's doing it, I must, I must say, I, I just don't understand him. And he's raised some concerns from other people in the, in the regular transit community advancing this. It, it's ridiculous. 
put some real light rail in there if you're going to do it, you know, and have a real transportation service to the people. Uh, Amtrak, Amtrak's fine. I know you hardly hit on it there. They are asking the states to kind of shoulder the burden of this, how that's going to affect long distance passenger trains remains to be seen. Uh, some states have taken the initiative, not to its credit, the state of Illinois is blanketed with the fine rail network. Another one that's, that's up there is the state of Michigan. Uh, other ones that are coming along are the Carolinas. Carolina even has their railroad engines named at their state, and they have their state logos and things like that. So whether or not you could say, well, we don't want government-operated railroad. And the railroad, in fact, in the Carolinas, they're expanding it. So I guess something's wrong with the people in the Carolinas that not only did they put in, they operated their own track and everything, bought their own engines, which Illinois is paralleling, and they're expanding their system. I don't know what could be wrong with those people. You would think they want private sector railroads. But they're expanding, they've been doing it for years and years and years. I wrote on it. Actually, it's really amazing. I got on that train, I thought I was in a handicap seat. When you talk about modes of travel versus airlines, and that's the amount of room you get on these trains. It's really nice. Let's see, what else here? But states are moving up there. <coughs> I spoke about the war. Interurbans. Also, if you go to the website, that'd be a cute little story. He talks about those are like, somewhat like L trains, a little higher quality. But they're actually, and they did network the entire of the United States. Now, one, of the, one guy did was he got on an interurban train in New York City. And he transferred, in essence, from one transit system to the next. And he made his way all the way to Chicago, Illinois. For, I think it took him quite a while. But it didn't cost him much money. I think he spent $20, $19 in transit there. But he made his, there was only one gap, I think, in the entire system he couldn't couldn't cross. It took him a while, but in essence, he took an L train from New York to Chicago. I found, actually, uh, there's another key story about this. I found this article way archived in a really peculiar thing. I put it on the internet, and later I heard a speech by the Secretary of Transportation talking about this. <laughs> and I, there's only one way, place he could have gotten it. Believe you me. It was like a publication that was put for out for about a year or two or something. And I said, my God, where did this come from? <laughs> but anyhow, thanks a lot. You got some good ideas there. You need, to, you need some experts like my pal and I and Harvey, and we can get you steered away. All right, thank you very much. Take her gets the last word. Let me try to redirect a little bit. Mr. Speaker, I can see I can see where I failed by the rebuttal. Clarification. Yeah. You said that we could that people don't produce their own electricity because it isn't economically feasible. The fact is, people don't produce their own electricity because the government gives exclusive right to the utility. Okay. Well, I was talking about they don't produce it through gas and diesel because it, it's a horribly, a horribly expensive way to produce it. But that's what a locomotive does in the United States. It produces electricity with diesel. So I was trying to make an argument about the costs of diesel. It's very costly. And, and it's the monopoly power that the oil industry has over us that, that forces us to run trains that way. But I want to get more at the heart of this. I can tell I, I failed in some places to make my point here. And like when you talk about the Republicans and Democrats getting this through, it's not going to work. My point was they are failing us. They are both corrupt or they're idiots, one or the other. They're either feigning idiocy to hide their corruption or they're just purely corrupt and pretend, you know, pretending to be idiots. I don't know which, which or they're actually idiots. I don't know. In the case of the Republicans, they're not feigning. They but, it, but, it, but it's both the Republicans and the Democrats that play this game. And they, so I wanted to, to talk about what political economy tells us about what they're doing wrong. And it's horribly absurd what they're doing wrong. So 
Tim's point about, he, does, he talks about public transit or the talk about Amtrak being a railroad nationalized. Again, I failed to get across my point. Amtrak is not a railroad. Amtrak is a passenger hauler. They happen to own some railroads, but they're primarily a passenger hauler. All of my talk was about a railroad. So Tim, when you talked about not using the public transportation systems, you were wrong. Your car was on a public transportation system the entire way. I'm talking about railways to complement the paved ways. Both of them provided, as a, as a common, both of them should be provided at a profit, not a subsidy, a profit. Then the other question is, should we run buses or rails of passenger haulers or freight haulers on that profit-making common at a subsidy? I don't know. That's another issue that I want to leave aside. So, so Charlie asks, how, how often, how many trains am I going to run on this? Again, bring it back to the interstate highway system. How many buses and cars does the government run on the interstate highway system? Well, they run the ones they need to move stuff, you know, bring the mail or whatever. But it's primarily a common service or common facility provided to us to do our thing. And that's what I want to do with the rails, is provide a common service and common facility to us to do our thing. So you might run your own. You might not like to drive a car. You might like to drive your locomotive, you know, so you just tool around on this thing whenever you can and uh, run it 220 miles per, per hour all the way to LA. Or um, someone might run a passenger hauler from Chicago to LA uh, leaving at 7 p.m., serving a nice dinner, go to sleep, wake up at 7 a.m. in LA at, at 220 miles per hour, we can do that. Uh, 300 miles per hour, we can do even better. So again, and I'm not trying to replace airlines, the airlines actually do quite well for efficiency and carbon emissions when they fly a long ways. Because almost all of the energy is used just to get you up. That part where they say, please leave your electronic devices off, okay, now you can turn them on. Almost all the energy has been used up already. Almost all of the, the carbon emissions have already occurred by the time they tell you you can turn on your electronic devices now. So if you just land then in Milwaukee, that's a horrible thing to do. But if you continue flying to Seattle or Anchorage or... Tokyo, that's great. So I think what rail does is fill in a nice gap. I think we could take half of the passengers that now go by plane, move them to a high-speed rail, take half of the passengers that are now moving in private automobiles, move those to rails, and also shrink it down. Do less trips, less distance on average, so, and, and be much happier at the same time and get more of what we want. So I want us to think about this infrastructure is foundational. If you say, if you were to say to someone, "We're going to have a we're going to have a highway system, but you can't fly," imagine how different our world would be. Or if we said to you, "You can fly, but we're not going to have any roadways," imagine how different the world would be. You you have to walk to the airport. Once you get there, you can fly anywhere you want in the world, but you're going to have to walk to get there. What what we've done is we've said we have these three technologies: aviation, via, motor vehicles, and trains. And we're only going to provide two of them. You know, that's what we've done for 100 years. We've had this excellent technology. I really think cars actually shine when, as a hobbyist. We, we've kind of done the opposite. We've made the trains the hobby, which they're really good at moving people around very efficiently, very quickly, and, and you know, uh, very, very much on time. And we've made them the hobby, and we've made the cars our dependency which are horrible, they run into traffic jams and all these other things. So if you actually can move half of the cars, passengers, to trains, your car travel is going to be all that much more enjoyable. You're going to, you know, you, nobody gets on the, nobody imagines they're going to get in their convertible and then go sit in the Dan Ryan and stop and go traffic. That's not what they, they're like, oh, I can't wait to get in my Corvette and drive three miles an hour and stop. You know, they're thinking of the open road. And so these trains will open up that road and, and make cars work much better too. So I, I think we have to change the way we think about government. Government is the provider of these commons. And that's a separate thing from subsidy because the commons can be provided at a profit, reduce our taxes and make it easier to subsidize the things that we care to subsidize. But I don't want to subsidize transport because again, I'm an environmentalist. I don't want to just give people, pay them to travel even though it's going to hurt the earth. I want them to pay the social costs of, of their travel and it probably won't incur that much cost, so they'll go ahead and do it. But they'll do it a little less, that's all. And they'll do it more by train. So if, if we, so what I'm saying is, let's add a train system. You're saying, where's the passengers going to come from? Well, if we do raise the gas tax to something more like Europe, you know, or if we do put a tax on carbon, 
where it becomes very costly to travel by car, they're going to flood. They're going to flock to this new train because now it's going to be the efficient way to travel, and each one is going to be reflecting the true social costs. We're not we're not burdening people for their car travel. We're just asking them to pay their fair share, and that's the same thing I think with oil and and coal and n nuclear. If we were asking them all to pay their fair share, we would all have windmills and solar panels because those are the more efficient energy uh, energy production methods right now. So um, let me see. Was there Anything else I missed? So, so again, uh, with Amtrak, you know, yeah, it runs at a loss, you know, but again, that's a passenger hauler, that's a separate thing, should it be subsidized? But that's the point, it's, it was made, it's running at a loss when it's working the way it was designed to work. We don't have to design it that way. We could charge, make people pay the social cost of their cars and make them pay the full social cost of the train, and I bet you they would still flock to the train, you know, because it, we're subsidizing those cars, too. So, you know, that, that's a whole other thing. And, and uh, government's no, no, no. So, and, and again, I want you to come back to the interstate highway system as a, as a stellar example of what government does for us. So if somebody says government screws up all the time, government's a failure, can't do anything right, ask them about the interstate highway system. Because it's when the government's doing things just as best as it does that it kind of slips into the background and we forget that it's even government involved. We think of the interstate highway system as just a natural feature of the earth. You know, like you can fly from O'Hare to to uh, Kennedy Airport in New York, you know, over some, over the air, that's just a natural feature, but you don't drive from Chicago to New York without an interstate highway system provided by someone, and provided well and, and efficiently, so, anyway. Let's thank our speaker. All right. Thank you. And everybody have a good night. Yeah, he wants the government to do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to be in the I'm going to be in the I'm going to be in the car. 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 I'm going to be in the car.